、今名も共有されてまでないですね。あ、これだと全然ダメなんだな。なんかそろそろライブ配信されてるかもしれないですね、これ。ああ、そうですか。ああ、じゃあそろそろ。大丈夫です。まだ大丈夫だと思うんですけど。で、これでフルスクリーン分をすると。スクリーンにすると、やっぱり発表しちゃうぞ。いや、なりました。なりました今フルスクリーンになってます。あなぜかわからない。かった。<笑>これでいきましょう。はい。はい。Thank you very much。はい、よろしくお願いします。
गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर विकारी मैम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग या आई गॉट योर पीडीएफ फाइल या यस कैन आई सी वेयर इज द पेपर देव नियोगी साहब ही इज देयर आई डोंट सी हिज नेम येट I don't see Professor Nyoki yet. Yeah. I also don't find because yeah, there is no communication from him. So people are joining. very fast so let us wait for 2 3 minutes okay In case uh, Professor Nyogi doesn't come in one minute, shall we switch the the speaker? Wait for one more minute. Otherwise, uh, we'll start from second speaker. Yeah. Uh, uh, second speaker is myself. Yeah. Okay. But but Mike, just now I I contacted Professor Dev Nyogi. Ha ha. and uh, he uh, is having some trouble so i have sent him the link again to his email okay okay i am just sending can i okay, okay. put in the chat box also no so he, he not able to join okay i am sending sir yeah i have sent him you can also send him just okay okay sir Hello. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Okay. I've sent it both to your Gmail and WebEx. Okay. 
Hall, hall A, Hall A, I have also sent. Oh, it's connecting? Yeah. Email to Dr. No. Niyogi now, right now. Don't worry about it. You send Dave Niyogi and then you, you join it. You just click join. It will work. Email, email is coming, right? Email is coming. Email and then join. Just to... Should I ask them to go with the next speaker and then we can we come back to you? Yeah, I joined me Okay, then Dr. Patanaik, shall we yeah, start yeah. with so, the yeah, second so, uh, speaker? Yeah. Okay, so we can uh, start it. Uh, yeah. And we can swap uh, when uh, Dr. Newby joined, we can have it his talk. Okay, okay, so let us switch the so, yeah. order. Yeah. So, okay. so very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our viewers for the last day of our IWM7. And now we start the invited session. So now may I request Professor Yukari and Takayabu to kindly chair the session. Chair the session. So yeah, Dr. Yukari obtained MSc degree in 1985 and PhD in 1993. From the University of Tokyo, Japan, the topic of her PhD was organized cumulus convective systems over the tropical Pacific Ocean. Dr. Yukari research topics are primarily in tropical meteorology, tropical convection, and global climate, global precipitation. She has received many awards, such as 1998, the Japan Meteorological Society Award, 2017, Sorosi Award, Distinguished Women Scientist Award, 2021, American Meteorological Society Fellow. Professor E.S., from 2019 to present, the Vice Director, Atmosphere and Ocean Research Institute, the University of Tokyo. Earlier, he, she was the member of the Scientific Council of Japan, professor in the Tokyo University, associate professor, and so on. So over to you, ma'am, now to kindly chair the session. Thank you very much for nice, uh, okay, introduction. Okay, uh, thank you very much for gathering to this session. The session, uh, because uh, I will, uh, I will uh, chair the session, and because the first speaker, Dr. Niyogi, is Dr. Niyogi here? Not yet. So we will change the order and start with the second speaker. <clears throat> like actually, the second speaker is myself. So let us start. Can you see the screen? Uh, yeah, you can see full screen, make it full screen. Can, is it in full, full screen? Yeah, it is full screen. Ma Madam, uh, please. Okay. It's not Thank in the full screen. Much. Now it's, the screen is split into two. So can you uh, go back? Mm -hmm. Can please, you please exit from the full screen now? Is it in full screen? Uh, no, I... not, not no, madam. I will guide you how. Do you see two screens? Yeah, two yeah. screens we are seeing. Ah, I see. How about this? No, no, not, not, not till one more not time. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry for the question. Yeah, now it's okay. Now okay. Okay. Okay, I will do it with this one. Oh, you know it. Okay. So, the title of my talk is Warm Season Heavy Precipitation Observed from Satellite Earth Observation. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present our recent works. Today's my talk is based on studies with Hiroki Tsuji. Chie Yokoyama and Atsushi Hamada. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Oh, it doesn't go. Okay. In recent years, frequently frequency of wide area heavy rainfalls causing disastrous floods is increasing in Japan. This photo of Mabicho in Kurashiki is taken at the July 
2018 heavy rainfall event. Over 237 lives were lost from this flood. After this event, we have been continuously suffering from record-breaking heavy rainfall events in 2019, 20, and also last year. Recently, we can ut utilize ample amount of accumulated spaceborne radar data from TRIM and GPM. This movie by JAXA shows a snapshot of a typhoon captured by the GPM DPR. By capturing rainfall events in three dimensions, we can investigate characteristics of rainfalls with their height, area, stratform convective ratio, and so on. Utilizing 11 years of TRIM-TR observation data, we made statistics of top 0.1% extreme rainfall events and extreme convection events at each 2.5 by 2.5 degrees latitude and longitude grid. Extreme rainfall events are defined with maximum near surface rainfall, and extreme convection is defined with maximum height of 40 dBc reflectivity. The, uh, the left panels show three-dimensional histograms of precipitation pixels over land for 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south. We can see that ra rainfall extremes are not very tall, while convection extremes are not extremely uh, intense at the surface. So it is found that Heaviest rainfall is not often accompanying tallest convection. I found in Dr. Yali Luo's talk on Wednesday, it is uh, uh, consistent with the observational evidence recently. Okay. Son et al. 2013 had compared heavy rainfalls over Korea and over Oklahoma. They showed that in the moist Korean warm season, the extreme rainfalls consist of warm type rainfalls, while in Oklahoma, they are mostly cold type rainfall. Our results are very consistent with their uh, warm types and cold types. And in the ref, left uh, right panels, Hamata Takaya Bufada compared the rainfall extremes and height extremes around Western Japan, this region. We found that uh, rainfall extreme systems have larger size and larger stratform ratio, relatively low convection, and less lightnings, indicating they consist of well-organized mesoscale systems. The environments for their uh, for their environments are relatively more stable compared to the climatology, and but very moist in the lower troposphere. Then what causes heavy rainfalls? Conventionally, CAPE is often used to measure the instability for heavy rainfalls. It is in any textbooks. And it is effective to measure the potential for very tall thunderstorms under the condition with warm air below and cold air aloft. However, Another essential instability with very moist atmosphere 
has not been equally considered. It is the most absolute unstable layer called mole, uh, as introduced in Brian Fritsch. When the atmosphere is very moist, even the cape is not very large, a layer lifting causes a kind of absolute instability to trigger convection. And moreover, can be maintained by continuous free tropospheric moisture uh, uh, supply. This kind of instability is associated with mesoscale convective systems and can cause wide area heavy rainfalls. This panel shows the three-dimensional rainfall structure captured at around on July 7, uh, 2018 heavy rainfall case. I showed the photograph in the beginning. It is clearly seen that despite the record-breaking rainfall amount, rainfall height, you can compare with the scale here. Rainfall height over 10 kilometers is scarcely observed. Now, left panel shows Imawari 8 water vapor image. Here is a uh, Korean peninsula, and here is Japan under the uh, thick, thick clouds. And the right panel show potential vorticity at 2,350 uh, Kelvin in black contours and uh, rainfall in color shades and precipitable water in uh, red contours. A band of very heavy rainfall appears in front of a deep upper level trough here. And it is analyzed that this trough dynamically prepared the updraft with very moist atmosphere in its front and caused the pres uh, persistent heavy rainfall. And it is reported that the July 2018 event is scarcely uh, accompanied by lightnings. Here we compared this event with the previous year's heavy rainfall, when the uh, active lightnings were reported. These are 24 hours accumulated rainfall for both events. We can see that 18 case, uh, there's a much wider area coverage, while that 17 case is confined to northern Kyushu. We then compared the time series uh, of JMA's northern Kyushu ground-based radar data for these cases. Red curves are for numbers of very tall rain grids uh, echoed with ecotop height larger than 10 kilometers while blue curves are for rain grids with moderate height rain grids with the uh, ecotop height less than 10 kilometers. We can readily see a distinct contrast between the two cases. For the 18 case, rainfall amount is primarily uh, from a moderate height uh, rainfalls, while in the 17 case, heaviest rainfall is brought by the tall rainfall over uh, with ecotop height over 10 kilometers. It is consistent with the difference in lightning activities. These panels compare environments in anomalies from the climatology. Left panel shows temperature anomalies and right panel shows the moisture anomalies, specific humidity anomalies from the climatology. The blue curve is 18, 2018 case, and the red curves are for 
2017 case. We can notice the temperature stratification in 18 case is even more stable compared to climatology. While it is more unstable in 17 case. For the moisture uh, specific humidity, both cases are very humid, but extremely humid in uh, 18 case. So these uh, correspond contrasts well corresponds to the statistics for extreme rainfalls and extreme convection I showed you before. At last, uh, we compare the, uh, the vertical cross sections. The left panel shows the plan views for the radar, sorry, radar and Himawari, Himawari clouds. We further diagnosed the mold condition for 2018 case. And at this uh, white dashed uh, line, we made vertical cross sections for the color shades shows horizontal wind speeds and vectors are wind vectors. And the black open oats you can find shows the grid, the mole condition is satisfied. Okay. And uh, we can find comparing with the uh, schematic by Brian Fritsch here, we can find a very similar condition with deep inflow layer lifting, preparing the mold condition and maintain the continuous heavy rainfall in this area. Okay. To summarize the comparison results, for the 18 case, a long-lasting rainfall occurred over an extensive area from moderately tall precipitation systems. Compared to the climatology, atmosphere was more stable but extremely moist. The upper tropospheric trough played a role to dynamically induce the ascending motion, which provided uh, such environment for a widespread heavy rainfall. For the 2017 event, uh, short-term rainfall occurred in a narrow area from extremely, extremely tall precipitation systems. Atmosphere was more unstable compared with the climatology. The upper trough played a role to destabilize the atmosphere, which provided environments for a very tall convection with lightnings. Lastly, a statistically, a statistical study was performed. 62 heavy rainfall cases with Kyushu region surrounded by this red rectang rectangle uh, mean uh, Kyushu region average rainfall over 60 millimeter per day are selected from uh, 15 years warm seasons. Left panel shows composite time series relative to the regional mean rainfall peaks rainfall peak here. And um, purple is precipitation and blue is shows free tropospheric moisture convergence and red curve shows the boundary layer moisture convergence below one kilometer. 
we can notice that free tropospheric moisture convergence will precede the rainfall increase uh, even 24 hours before the precipitation peak. Right panel shows the grid numbers in the same region uh, where mall conditions are diagnosed. We can confirm that uh, mall is associated with very heavy rainfall cases. Free tropospheric moisture convergence prepare more condition with deep layer lifting, which maintains the heavy rainfalls. To summarize, in recent years, frequency of wide area heavy rainfalls causing disastrous floods are increasing in Japan. And statistical studies of rainfall events observed from spaceborne precipitation radars revealed that extremely heavy rainfalls do not often accompany extreme tall convection. Environments for heavy rainfalls show relatively stable but extremely moist condition. There are two types of heavy rainfalls. One is with cape type instability. Another is with most absolute stable layer. Wide area heavy rainfalls are associated with free tropospheric moisture convergence, preparing mold environments, which is favorable for organized convection. Atmospheric water vapor amount has been significantly increasing in past 30 years with the global warming. We should prepare for a further increase of mold type heavy rainfalls in the warmer climate. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, the <clears throat> talk is open for questions. Sorry, because I am opening my <laughs> summary. I cannot see the. I cannot see the uh, the hand your hand. So could you speak up if you Hello. can? You have a. Hello, question. This is yeah, I can hear. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Yukari, Dr. Yogusan. Very nice talk, excellent talk. Thank uh, you. Uh, I have just one question. You you compared the July 2017 and July 2018, and yes. uh, the 18 heavy rainfall you, you showed it is more dynamically induced heavy precipitation, and uh, the nine, uh, 17 was more of a cape type of instability. Uh, so my question is, but the July 2017 was it also related to a typhoon or something? Was it due to typhoon 2017? Uh 2017 case was not with the typhoon case, but uh, it is uh, associated with. I didn't show for the 17 case, but it is associated with also a trough. It was coming. Yeah. Uh, Atop of this region here, and but the short, shorter trough, and with uh, and below the just below the trough, trough cold air, oh. this uh, heavy precipitation happened. Okay, yeah, okay. But and yeah, this is also this yeah. in yeah. this case is also associated with the deep trough and associated with the uh, uh, the uplift of the whole thing, but the rainfall itself is not associated with the large scale, uh, large scale uplift, up, updraft, but it is also the organized system. Okay, but, uh, but the 18 was associated with the typhoon activity, was it? Was it? 18, yes, there was a typhoon just before this okay. thing. So typhoon prepared, uh, typh uh, typhoon in remote place uh, already prepared the very moist condition. Also yeah. prepared the moist atmosphere. It was also important. Thank you very much. Karisa. Thank you Thank very you. much. So if there's no other questions, just, it, it's just uh, on time. <laughs>
So, uh, let me stop my screen. Uh, just a moment. Okay. So we are back to the screen. And uh, do we have Dr. Professor Niyogi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See you. Ah, thank you very much. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I would like to uh, introduce Professor Niyogi. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dev Niyogi is uh, John, uh, Brick, John E. Brick Elliott Centennial Endowed Professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Jackson School of Geosciences and Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering. He is a graduate faculty at Alton Institute of Computational Engineering and Science and University of Texas Center for Space Research. He is also Professor Emeritus, Purdue University, Department of Agronomy and Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences, and former Indiana State Climatologist. And Professor Niyogi's research seeks to significantly contribute to our understanding of the Earth system, particularly the urban and agricultural landscapes, and the dynamic role of coupled land surface processes on weather and regional uh, meteorological extremes. An important ongoing an emerging focus of his research is to translate the scientific work undertaken into decision tools and portals with a particular fo focus on hydroclimatology and sustainable climate ready resilient cities. Thank you very much for uh, uh, attending your uh, to this uh, workshop and let us start your talk. So very uh, much. thank you very much, Professor. Okay. Takayabu, uh, as well as uh, uh, all the uh, dignitaries uh, here at the IWM7. It's uh, really a pleasure. Uh, I, I wish things would have been improved just a bit that I could have been there in person, but this is the best I could do to at least uh, get a chance to interact with all of you. Uh, considering we have about uh, 15 minutes available for this talk, I'll try to rush through. There are several things that I'm uh, wanting to share, and I, I hope in my excitement, if I am exceeding my time, that the chair will guide me to stop, and I'll be happy to pause at that moment. Um, okay. So without much ado, uh, let me say that what I'm going to be talking about is essentially the role of land surface feedbacks, uh, particularly from the context of the Earth system models. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on the context of trying to make a case for the human dominated landscapes, uh, the emerging role of AIML, uh, digital twins and sensing the unsensed is going to be towards the end of my talk about what and some of the comments related to that, especially as we go into the context of land surface processes. This presentation is uh, when I look back at conferences, one of the things I always remember is that during my PhD and earlier days, these were influential. Uh, the experts who are here, there is nothing much I can tell them. Uh, I'm here to learn from them, but perhaps there are some emerging researchers and some PhD scholars who are trying to look for some topical areas, and this particular talk is really targeted towards them. The point I want to raise in my talk is that monsoon research is one of the most important and timely topical areas in the world right now. And there are obvious reasons for this, those the concentration of population, the economic burst that is going on, uh, the preponderance of hazards and the highly vulnerable communities that all exist in and around the monsoon belt region. So even when you say I want to study climate, even do you study, I want to study uh, any of the tropical regions, monsoon research is really the confluence of everything that the humanity can do right now. And I really challenge all the aspiring researchers to continue that research domain going forward. The second point I will really make is that in the context of monsoon, 
I'm going to highlight the role of land scale feedbacks and how high resolution information is starting to become extremely critical. We are no longer interested in just knowing what is happening at a continental scale, but really what is happening at a minor and finer scale. And with that, the role of boundary layer and land surface processes are starting to grow. Uh, for those of you who would like to read some more about the improvements that are going on, I recommend this uh, really interesting book that came up in a similar such workshop a couple of years back uh, in 2019, actually, that has been published. Uh, Dave Randall, J.S. J. Uh, Ravi uh, Mukhopadhyay and several others that were involved in that. It talks about the physical processes. In particular, there's one chapter I have which is related to land surface processes and uh, uh, anyone wanting more details, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, please read more along that chapter going forward. Um, and indeed, when you're talking about monsoon, you must have heard about a number of uh, fantastic talks, but I would also highlight continually that uh, look into some of the old reviews, the seminal work that has gone on in prior studies. One that I use quite routinely is the work by Professor Gardgill in my class, and also the papers by Peter Webster and his recent book and so forth. Um, there are sub So the initial work, when we start looking into the context of the monsoons has been on the large scale flow patterns and how the circulation patterns have evolved. There have been then a shift in terms of the manner in which the oceanic processes associated with variability and the active break phase has started to come up. Um, and then there has been a series of papers that have been on the regional dynamics, uh, work done by Krishnamurti and Sikka and so forth. And here's a note I want to say to the students that I have started to notice that let's not be lazy and just do a Google Scholar and then find what has been important in the last five years. Go back to the really 30, 40, 50 years before what papers have been published on this topic, and you'll find some really amazing knowledge that is not gleaned by just looking at one Google Scholar uh, kind of survey going forward. The key point is that monsoon is not a monolithic singular event. It is not a single system that just gets dumped over a region. There are many features associated with it. Onset, active break periods, depressions, onset that coming up and going forward, disturbances, cyclones, heavy rain events, and tremendous variability in terms of these spatiotemporal patterns that exist across the region. So monsoon, when you start thinking, is all of these things interactively working forward and moving. You can also look at it in the context of monsoons in terms of the applications that are emerging. That monsoon, from the context of what is required for, say, the agricultural management, uh, where the timeliness, the spatial resolution, the events become important from urban flood and flood management perspective, where you're looking at, you know, the quantum of the rains, the timing of the rain and so forth. You're also looking at it from the context of what's happening with regards to the air quality in the region, especially in the monsoon region, as we call. And then, of course, uh, we are in an energy uh, pricey region. And so the wind energy and the potential that comes up. So each of these applications are now demanding more of us as we start saying that we are doing work in the area of monsoon applications. So there is a higher demand for more local scale, higher resolution information. There's a higher demand for all that things that we now feel are making a come of age for the boundary layer, local feedbacks, convection and land feedback starting to, to come together. The era is emerging, the era is now. And in fact, uh, like many of the things that Professor T. and Krishnamurti and uh, Professor Sekka had been doing, and uh, this is one of my prized paper, which was with both of these uh, stalwarts, uh, which essentially showed a key point. Even in their own work, they said that when you are looking at the passage of the rain and the onset after making landfall or when the onset occurs, that the first 20, 25 days, there's going to be a tremendous sensitivity to things like soil moisture and some of the land surface feedbacks coming forward. Uh, unfortunately, this work has not evolved much. Uh, I mean, I know Arvindam and other have done some of the areas and uh, uh, some work in this area, but this is an area I think that is ripe for improved predictability going forward. Uh, there's a couplet I have put together in that book where it says that if you look at the land basked in the sun's rotation, and this is basically like a yogi balancing the energies, the moist, latent, potent, sensible, and the ground. And amidst these energies, you're going to get the turbulence and the thermals that are going to rise. And then you have this flux gradients, and then you're going to have convergences. 
And therein lies the whole process of convection and the rain that starts coming up. But when we are looking at this whole interplay that is going on, very often we have been focusing on clouds and the large scale dynamics without really understanding what has been the feedback associated with the land and the gradients and some of the some of the heterogeneities and how they have triggered some of the vagaries that we took all about in terms of the monsoon predictions going forward. So why does this happen? It happens typically because of many things that are going on in the monsoon domain. Uh, deforestation, urbanization, irrigation, agricultural intensification, which all leads to changes in the energy balance, the feedback, as I mentioned in the previous couplet, and it has an impact onto the larger scale processes going forward. So there is a shift in time when we are looking at it in the context of the climatic shift about how the rural urban population has been shifting in this region, how the population intensity has been increasing in this region. And we have also been seeing tremendous agricultural and human domination of agriculture and urbanization. So if you look at it in the context of the monsoon domain, the human dominated landscapes, urban and agriculture, and the decisions that are coming up from the human perspective are dramatic. And if you look at what are the global land atmosphere coupling hotspots, they all align in places where there has been a human intervention into the atmospheric and water cycle going forward. And the monsoon region is one of that hotspot where we have to look at it. And we have an impact when we start improving land surface processes. Uh, as part of the National Monsoon Mission, we had created the uh, first four kilometer, 30 year soil moisture, soil temperature data set. Now through NCMR, we have a even better, newer idea AA, the, the IMD uh, data anal analysis that is available now. And under this, now you have information that is suitable in the context of providing information for the models. And under that, you can see an improvement associated with the land, associated with the feedback into not just local scale storms, but as you show here in things like the monsoon depressions in the simulation of cyclones and so forth. Uh, here's an example about a thunderstorm simulation when you have an improved landscape and land surface presentation that how it can improve processes at a micro scale, at a large scale, and how that could have an impact going forward in the context in which we try to represent the feedbacks associated with monsoon. But monsoon is not just the rain, it is all the interplay that goes on with it. Uh, and this is detectable uh, at the very simplest level if you look at it in the context of urban heat island, in the context of how cities are creating changes in temperatures. It has an impact in the manner in which the heat waves start emerging. We have seen that in the 2015 Delhi heat wave, uh, how the role of urbanization ex aggravated what was happening with a large scale heat wave, creating these pockets of highly potent uh, heat re regimes. We have also seen that in the context of you know, future climate mapping, that you know, how do we design cities? Are we going to have monsoonal systems which are going to be settling in, which are going to be spreading out? and they will have a dramatic impact in the manner in which the cities grow, compact, spread out, and the feedbacks will be quite different. And we know that the heating of the cities changes the domain of the urban domain, it changes the convergence patterns, it changes the rainfall, and the associated rainfall creates pockets of heavy rain. This we know by now. This is not something we are exploring. This is a known fact. And under that, we start seeing that even in the monsoon region, places where we have more urbanization, we have more increased rainfall occurring in our climatic data set. And this is something that has been uh, noted now in number of studies. Uh, Subimal Ghosh and others have, for instance, been doing a number of interesting studies around this topic. And we have been uh, following up with this kind of feedback with global data sets in terms of analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we represent these cities or agricultural effects, which are tiny micro scale features into a large climate grid? How do you set this up into the scale with regards to what's happening with the monsoonal domain? How do you get this local scale forcing that could have a feedback that we want to represent in the model system? That is the challenge we are dealing with at this point. So what we need are requirements of an input, which are very difficult to come at a global scale. Uh, we are talking about human decisions, we are talking about data sets, we are talking about a community that needs to work together. So for instance, from the urban context, we have the International Association of Urban Climatology, IAUC, and we have created this World Urban 
data analysis and portal tool, the Wood app, which is providing the framework for studying what is happening with regards to the urban processes. But you can't just create data and the maps. You need to create the interface that goes from the data to the model and this parameterization. And that process is still missing right now. And so one of the way this is being done is what is being known as a digital twin of approaches for the earth system models. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have this proof of concept going on right now through a pretty large uh, US Department of Energy project in which we are working with the Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab, uh, taking the E3SA model. We are putting the WERF model and the ADSERC, which is a storm surge ocean circulation model. And we are going basically across from 100 kilometer grids to one meter hydraulic uh, inundation studies. And so the context is, how do you now take models which are at this multiple scales and try to have this scalability across very small to very big scales resolution? And there, of course, the approach seems to be that physical parameterizations, physical coupling, dynamical coupling will fail. That is not going to help. But this is where approaches like the AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning has been helping us create surrogate models and talk to each other and create this framework of scalability. And that looks very promising as we start looking at it in the context of the monsoon research going forward. Uh, Manmit Singh, who was is with uh, Dr. Krishnan, he was visiting us uh, as part of the Kalam uh, uh, Fellowship last year. And uh, he helped us in do some of this work with regards to, you know, the integration of the machine learning based uh, uh, cuboid sphere analysis and testing it out and so forth. And we have a couple of other students who are working in trying to create this uh, uh, digital twin framework. One such example of where we are trying to now put urbanizations or cities or agriculture into monsoon models or monsoon simulations for climate models is through this world urban data analysis portal tool, as I mentioned. And with that, we are not just getting now the maps, but we have started creating the framework for the vertical height of the buildings and other information, the kind of stuff that was not available before. This, by the way, is for the city of Bangalore. Uh, we had a project with Professor Mujumdar there from ISC on urban flooding, and we had been using this information for studying some of the urban uh, flood aspects going forward. But here's the output from the Globus data set. Uh, that has just been recently created by one of my PhD students, Harsh Kamat, who incidentally was at ISC with uh, Professor JS for a while. And uh, he has been using, working with a few of researchers here in terms of creating the satellite data sets and creating this a, a, a machine learning based approach for creating a high resolution urban data set for height. And that building height data, the Globus data set, is now we are trying to be integrating for the urban modeling studies in a global context. So the question now is no longer how to detect effects of land surface on monsoon systems, but really looking forward, it is how do we represent these effects? How do we take what we know about how land is affecting and start putting it into earth system models, whether it is the uh, IIT MESM, whether, or it is the E3SM, or whichever we're trying to go for, or whether it is a WRF model. How do you start putting these land processes such that it improves the monsoon feedback is a thing going forward. And that's the theme I would encourage all the in emerging researchers to look into. Improving predictions of multiscale processes, understanding the causality between the relations it, with regards to what's happening from the land processes to the dynamics of the process, creating tools, not just using models, but you know, improving models and not just saying I created a parameterization, but sort of creating the large data set. Um, I will uh, stop in a few minutes, I guess, uh, or maybe I should stop right away. Um, in a few minutes, please, in a few uh, minutes, what? yeah. Okay, so I'll just stop up here by saying that there are five points I would like you to consider. First is go from instead of global to local to local to global. That is the first point I'll make. The second point is that a lot of now monsoon research requires information in our backyard. Uh, we, we need to create this really fine scale resolution. Third, we know a lot about the physical processes. What we do not know is how do you introduce human decisions and how these human decisions will alter the energy balance, the water balance is one of our emerging challenge going forward. And for this, we have to create new data. And I give some examples of that, uh, you know, 
We can say this is a building. We don't know what is the material of the building, etc. Fourth, AIML is going to be a way forward. That is for sure. But how do we ensure open data? How do we ensure reproducibility of the results? And how do we ensure that the manner in which our meteorological community has moved forward by creating this community models retains its, its identity without everyone saying this is my model and this is my code and this is my black box. That is one of the challenge I think as a community we need to look forward. And the last point I'll make is even though AI and ML is so attractive, I would say that no researcher should forget that you cannot use it unless and until we have some very strong foundational understanding of the physics and the dynamics of the problem. And without this, we are only going to create more black boxes, which are not going to be a step forward, but a two step backward in our ability to simulate monsoons. So with that, I'll thank and I really appreciate giving me this time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Niyogi, for a wonderful talk. So now this is uh, open for questions to the audience. Ah, yes, uh, Rupa Kumar, yeah. please speak up. Thank you, Yukari. Thank you very much, Dave. That's an excellent presentation. And I have, uh, I have not heard such a passionate uh, uh, talk on, uh, on the role of land. Uh, before, particularly in the context of the monsoons. Uh, I have two probably uh, a bit related questions. Uh, we know that uh, the landscape, the, the land surface has changed tremendously over the past couple of hundreds of years. Uh, and we do have uh, good data sets or extending over the last 200 years. So what is the best way to bring out the signature of the land surface changes that we know have taken place uh, because in, in most cases, monsoon looks fairly stable in, in that, at least in, in the long-term uh, context. So uh, is there any way to bring out that part? The other one is I can see your focus on the urban uh, uh, land surface changes, but at the same time in heavily populated countries like India, even the rural landscapes have tremendously changed. Uh, so, uh, don't we think uh, we should also look at how these changes have affected the monsoon variability? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Uh, great questions. The first question uh, relates to how do we detect? We know landscape has changed, and yet we think the monsoon is stable. And so, how do we then detect the effect of this landscape change onto the monsoon? That's a, a challenge that you're posing, and that's actually fascinating. Uh, if we look at monsoon into this singular index, then we will not be able to capture the micro scale changes that have been going on in the landscape fragmentation in terms of the changes that are going on. So I think to understand the effect on the monsoon feedback, it would be better if we also look at the data into that fragmented and much more micro scale. Like if you take at locations and then look at it in the context of changes. So we did that in one of our study, uh, Chandra Kishtawal was a lead on that. And I think Subimal subsequently had a couple of students work on that. So if you just take certain grids where we know we have data and we know we have had a landscape change like urbanization or land transformation, with that land transformation, you expect the temperature change, which we know has happened. But if you look at it around the grids, you can detect the change in the rainfall as well in a very uh, sophisticated manner and a statistically significant manner. Now, so the question then comes, does this scale up? So what we have seen, at least in the case of irrigation, in the case of the Northern India, this is so organized that you could see with the shift that has occurred in the irrigation patterns, the greenness has changed. And with that greenness, the, uh, the, the monsoon low in that region has shifted and you could see a change in the rainfall patterns. So these kind of diagnostics, which are really targeted some regions where you know there has been a change in landscape, we can tease out the signature. So now the question would be, how do we start putting this in a more predictive sense? And that's, I think, where some of the agent-based approaches or modeling will kind of come in. Um, as far as your second question, uh, 
we are talking about urbanization, but what about rural? I absolutely agree. Uh, if I had 10 more minutes, I would have probably talked about the things we need to do into the uh, agricultural domain, which I think is a fascinating thing. We have just now started putting crops in weather models. We would love to see the feedback of crops in and the, uh, the, the rural development in the context of the weather feedback, and then it has a complete system going forward. But I see a couple of hands, so I'll pause here. I don't know if I'm exceeding my time. Thank you very much. I saw Dr. Patanaik hand, but uh, he. Then I can otherwise letter I can send. I can briefly ask one question if there is time. Okay, very brief question. Okay, okay. So Professor Nyogi, it's a very, very nice talk. As you, as you said that AI ML use, little bit skeptical about that one. So, okay, so yeah, that's true also because of many constraints, but then which are the area that uh, you think that will give a better forecast in future? Oh, great question. Let, let me highlight that I am all for AI ML being used, but I want it, I'm saying that it should not be used just blindly, which is sometimes what is happening. It has a great application like we have used here for creating a part of parameterizations. So you have a dynamic model. So I think the terminology people use is physics guided machine learning or physics guided AI. Those kind of approaches are well uh, accepted as a good way forward. And I think we should encourage that part. Specific to forecast here, I would say that many of our model are very sensitive to some of the parameter choices we use. I'll give a simple example from something I understand. There is a term called canopy resistance that is used as a function of land use type in every model that is running right now, which is uses land. That canopy resistant term has two values, 60 seconds per meter, 100 seconds per meter, depending on whether it is a crop or agriculture. We know that is not right. And yet we have not been able to modulate it to give us a better parameterization constant. And so we can use some of the data set to create some of these constants to be much more dynamic by use of AI ML. Or we could use it to simplify a more complex model like a convection scheme to come up with a more uh, simplified representation to hasten and create more ensembles out of it. So those are the manner in which I think people have really found some good examples of progress. And I, I do hope that once you have a good model and an expert like you, and you know, if you can just work with some of the modules, those could be expanded and improved further. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, thank you again for your wonderful talk and good discussions. So let's move on to the next talk. Next talk will be by Hatsu, uh, Professor Hatsuki Fujinami. But uh, okay, Dr. Hatsuki Fujinami is a lecturer of the Institute for. Space as Environmental Research, Nagoya University, Japan, and a member of Asia Australian Monsoon Working Group of GWX Clyber Monsoon Panel. His research interests include understanding the processes responsible for precipitation variations in monsoon Asia over a broad range of time scales from diurnal cycle to climate change. Okay, so the his talk is precipitation and its variability in the high elevation area of the Nepal Himalayas. So, uh, Dr. Fujinami, please start. Uh, thank you very much. For... Hi, Yukari san. Uh, Hi. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. It looks fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. I am Fujinami from Nagoya University, Japan. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to such important international workshop on Monsoon. Uh, it's a great honor for me. The title of this presentation is a presentation and its variability in the high elevation areas of Nepal Himalayas. Uh, the collaborator working on this uh, topic. You 
Oh, this is outline of this presentation. Uh, at first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our instant observation going on in Eastern Nepal Himalayas. And based on the observational result, I'd like to talk about two topics in the presentation. Uh, one is Diana cycle of presentation uh, that induced by land surface effect in the higher elevation by the glacial area. This is a photo of uh, one of uh, our site and the second one is a heavy rainfall event uh, that is induced by uh, monsoon low and the typical interseasonal oscillation influences and finally i will give a summary a hydrological cycle in the himalayas is uh, characterized by large amount of summer precipitation, especially in the eastern, uh, central to eastern Himalayas. And there are glaciers, and these glaciers are summer accumulation types. So summertime precipitation is crucial for glacier mass balance. And there are uh, headwaters of major rivers such as Ganges and Brahmaputra, and they provide, it, provide uh, important water resources for the people who live in the uh, South Asia. However, precipitation amount itself and its variability in summer are still poorly understood because uh, uh, meteorological stations are uh, extremely scarce at the higher elevation in the Himalayas. So we are conducting a HYPEX, a HYPEX stand for Himalaya precipitation study and the Asia PEX project to understand some precipitation and its variability in the higher elevation of the Himalayas. And this is an international joint research project between Japan and Nepal, and this is a project period. Uh, the only noticed uh, almost all period is uh, affected by COVID-19, unfortunately, but uh, we uh, make best of uh, this opportunity uh, of course safely. And this uh, project is performed by using the observation and satellite, uh, GPM and train and meteorostat and the uh, fiber analysis and some cloud resolving regional models. Okay, this is the language network of our uh, a project along Lorwarin Valley. And uh, Lorwarin Valley is located here uh, in the northeastern part of, uh, of uh, Nepal Himalayas. Uh, there are eight language stations along the valley and upper two uh, uh, site uh, uh, automatic weather stations. And the network covers uh, from 1,000 meters above sea level to uh, 5,500 like this. And this is the photo from Google Earth around the upper two site uh, here. Uh, this, this is the Zoloropa Glacial Lake, the biggest glacial lake in the Nepal. And this is Turakarading Glacier and Trumbo Glacier. Uh, we can see the two, two upper uh, site uh, located by the glaciers. Unfortunately, uh, AWS2 doesn't work well so far. Okay, let's uh, see the result of, of interesting diamond cycle based on the uh, AWS-1 observation. Uh, this is the time series, diamond time series of precipitation, and this is the local time. Uh, we can see two peaks in the precipitation. One is the uh, data, and the other one is night time. The daytime precipitation peak is accompanied by barley wind uh, induced by surface heating, so it causes condensation around the slope. On the other hand, in the nighttime peak, we cannot see any significant signals at the surface, at a surface meteorological element. It indicates large-scale low-level low monsoon flow to the south of the Himalayas might be an engine to enhance nighttime precipitation. Similar dian cycle, such as uh, twice daily maxima, uh, was already reported in the past field experiment like this, and uh, the Kumbu Himalayas and the other glaciers and Martian river basins like this. Okay, let's expand our viewpoint from one site observation to whole Nepal Himalayas. 
Uh, this is the result from cluster analysis of Diana cycle of rainfall frequency based on long-term trim precipitation radar data set uh, to see if the uh, twice daily maxima are unique to the high elevation area or not. And this is the distribution of clusters. We can see the region of red colors and yellow colors at higher elevation. Uh, in contrast, in the, at the lower elevations, we can see the area of blue colors. Uh, Diana variation in the higher elevation of, uh, of red color and yellow color shows twice daily maximum, uh, similar to the uh, AWS one. In contrast, at lower elevations, uh, Diana cycle show only one nighttime peak from midnight to early in the morning, like this. <laughs> Please. Just a moment, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, this figure shows latitude local time cross section in the uh, precipitation properties to see the contrast contrasting features in the two peaks. Uh, this is precipitation, we can see two, twice daily maximum in daytime and nighttime. And this is precipitation, this is convective type rainfall, and it, this is stratiform type rain, and this is storm height, raindrop height. And from these figures, uh, daytime peak features are convective, more convective type precipitation with lower raindrop height in contrast in nighttime Peak uh, more strat stratiform type precipitation here and higher length of height. Okay, let's see the mechanism for driving the twice daily maxima of precipitation based on ELA 5 layer analysis. This is latitude local time section of vertically integrated water vapor flux and its meridional component. And this is the Himalayan slopes. Uh, we can see the two maximum of moisture flux uh, towards the Himalayas. One is daytime, uh, the other one is nighttime. The timing corresponds to the uh, twice daily maximum precipitation that observed all, uh, over the Himalayan slopes. The maximum of in daytime is induced by heated slope surface uh, uh, because of uh, anabatic wind. And in, in other, on the other hand, that night peaks in nighttime is, is coming from the low level jet process over the Gandhitic plane in nighttime. Uh, this is the figure to see the contrasting pattern of water vapor flux anomalies uh, during daytime and nighttime. And this is daily mean field. In daytime, southerly moisture flux appears only around the Himalayan regions uh, because of upslope wind uh, due to uh, heated slope surface. In, but in nighttime, large scale moisture flux anomalies extend over uh, Indian subcontinent, including uh, Gangetic Plain, like this. And this large scale moisture flux anomaly induced large scale moisture flux convergence around the Himalayas. Uh, so this led to st uh, more stratiform type rainfall in nighttime. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, a uh, heavy rainfall event due to monsoon low through mass scale process. Uh, this is based on the observation at the Dongan station at 3,000 above sea level. Uh, this is a daily time series of rainfall in 2090 observation summer. And we, uh, a heavy rainfall event occur on Eighth and ninth July in the summer. Uh, this this one. Uh, this is the rain, uh, hourly rainfall rate during this event. Uh, precipitation rapidly increase at uh, six p.m. and reach maximum around eight to nine p.m. 
uh, during this event, line shaped crowd, crowd band uh, passed over the Dongan station. Stop again. Please wait a moment. Why? Cannot control my slide. <laughs> How many slides are remaining? Uh, uh, we can share from our and otherwise. Yeah, maybe four or five slides. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. So, so sorry for my trouble. Uh, this is already uh, infrared image from Meteosat I in the ocean co data coverage, and this figure shows uh, uh, crowd distribution at uh, at the uh, uh, heavy heavy rainfall event at eight o'clock. We can see line shaped crowd band over the Dongan station, and there is some uh, strong convection inside the band. So then, uh, not about moving line-shaped cloud band with mesoscale systems passed over the Dongan during this heavy rainfall event. Mm -hmm. Usual. Stop bugging. I'm sorry. Why? <laughs> Usual. Yeah, uh, this is snowflake snow scale atmosphere circulation during heavy rainfall event. Uh, this is Dongan station, and this is line shape. Rain band, and we can see strong cyclonic circulations at, to the south of the Himalayas, close to the Himalayas, like this. This is the monsoon low. So during this event, a monsoon low is located to the, uh, the to the south of the Himalayas and very close to the Himalayas, and this low monsoon low induced by uh, induced large southeasterly moisture transport towards the Himalayas, and the Himalayas slope interaction between the Himalayan slopes and the southeasterly appear to cause the rain, uh, crowd and rain band. And the monsoon low or monsoon depression uh, low pressure systems is major rainfall producing system over South Asia in summer. The effect of monsoon low pressure systems on the precipitation on the Himalayas is to moisten the uh, the troposphere, especially in the middle troposphere to the south of the Himalayas, and to enhance water vapor transport toward the southern slopes. It's very important environment uh, to enhance precipitation over the Himalayan slopes. And actually, during this event, monsoon low pressure system is located close to Himalayas. The locations of monsoon low pressure system uh, tend to be specially clustered by the interseasonal oscillation, such as uh, boreal seasonal interseasonal oscillation (BCSO) or and quasi biweekly interseasonal oscillation mode. Uh, this is the time sequence of geotic potential height and zonal wind at uh, 500 hectopascals. The day zero is uh, uh, a day of the heavy rainfall event at Dongan Station. And this is uh, the monsoon low, low near close to the Himalayas. And this is day minus two, this is day minus four, and this is day plus two, and this, this is day four, day plus four. Uh, in day minus four, uh, there is low pressure area. Uh, this is monsoon trough, and the red color indicates westerlies, while the blue color indicates easterlies. And this synoptic uh, situation is coming from northward uh, propagating BC mode. And from day four to day zero, uh, westerly areas move northward towards the Himalayas. And please look at here. Over uh, in the China Peninsula, uh, we can see high pressure system like this, and this high pressure area move westward over the Bay of Bengal as time progresses. 
So the rest of pro pro propagating high over the Bay of Bengal push the uh, cyclonic system northward like this. And this westward propagating high is associated with uh, westward propagating quasi by weekly mode. Yes, this is the final figure. Uh, this is a, a schematic illustration to explain how the combination of different, different interseasonal oscillation modes such as BCSO and QBW can influence the location of LPS over the, around the Gangetic Plain. When the low cyclonic circulation anomalies of BCSO was located here, and the rest of the propagating uh, anticyclonic anomalies of QBW mode is here. A uh, low level, level cyclonic uh, uh, wind shear is enhanced around the Gantt plane. And in addition, the vertical wind shear become also weak. It's a kind of favorable environment for the genesis and tracks of LPS. Okay, this is summary. Uh, the Meteorological observation at elevations of uh, more than 4,000 meters above sea level over the Himalaya is still extremely scarce. So they are essential uh, understand, to understand or monitor the high mountain uh, water cycle with glaciers. And in the cycle precipitation, uh, the, the twice daily maxima are corresponding to day and night occur widely across the higher elevation of the Nepal Himalayas, including the glacialized high elevation area. And upslope flows due to surface heating uh, drives the daytime rainfall peak and the most nocturnal jet uh, over the Ganges plain creates the nighttime peak. In short, the land surface effect is very important to induce dynamic cycle of precipitation in Nepal, uh, in Himalayas, not only in Nepal Himalayas, also, but also uh, other Himalayas. And in the heavy rainfall event, a much scale process among the combination of different types of interseasonal oscillation and low pressure system and line shaped rain band and mesoscale uh, strong convection led to the heavy rainfall event at Dongan Station uh, in 2019. Uh, the understanding of low mass scale process uh, from not only topics, but also in middle latitude are needed to better understand precipitation variability in the Himalayas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Fujinami, for a very interesting talk. Uh, because of the time, do, uh, we can take one quick question from the audience. If not from the audience, there is a question on the chat box. Can I read it? Okay. There is a chat box uh, question. Yeah. Uh, can it be generalized that the precipitation day nighttime peak is due to convective, sorry, stratiform. stratiform cloud systems? Pardon? Okay. Ah. You. Well, is it uh, daytime peak convection? Yeah. Uh, nighttime peak is stratiform. You yes, this one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. In nighttime, more stratiform rain, more mm. stratiform rain. Yeah. Yeah, there's both convective type rain and stratiform type rain, but yeah. And in uh, that case, the radiative effect can. Yeah, I uh, in house nighttime rain. Uh I uh, at present I don't think this is coming from radiative fault or radiative type cloud. Mm -hmm. Uh I think this is uh, coming from large scale uh okay. moisture convergence along the slopes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Okay, then let's move on to the you last to speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Chidong Chan.
Are you here? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Can you okay, hear me? Thank you. Hi. Yes. Uh, Professor Chidon Chan is leads the Oceania Ocean Climate Research Division of the NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory (PMEL) in Seattle, Washington. He joined NOAA in 2016 after his 20-year academic career in University of Miami. He received PhD in meteorology from the Penn State University. Masters in Meteorology from the University of Utah and Bachelor from Peking University. His research interests include tropical large scale air sea interaction and intraseasonal variability, especially the Madenchurian oscillation, uh, we weather climate interface, field observations of weather climate processes, and new observation observing technologies. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Chidong. So, so do you please I, I, I'll share, share my screen. screen. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Okay, one second. The title of his talk is ARC Transition Zone in the context of monsoons. Okay, it okay. says it's still connecting. The internet connection is not very good. Okay. Um, by the way, a uh, greeting from uh, Tropia. Uh, I'm in a small town on the west coast of uh, Italy, where I'm traveling through. Mm -hmm. um, the internet connection is relatively weak, so okay. it says, still sets connecting. So, let me see what I did. Okay, one okay. second. We what, can, what do you see? We can share. Uh, we, don't, we don't still see the screen. Uh, uh, yeah, it's coming. You yeah, can see that? Okay. Yeah, 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 fine. Great, great. Let me see what I can put in the presentation mode. How about that? Yeah, it looks fine. It's good. Okay, so I'll start. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, in my talk, I'm going to introduce you maybe a new concept, maybe not, uh, which uh, I prefer, I, I refer to as uh, the air sea transition zone. And because this is a monsoon conference, so I'll start with the monsoon, but uh, this concept is not uh, unique to monsoon. It applies to all uh, air interaction scenario. So these two uh, schem schematic diagrams, uh, just two examples showing how important air interaction is to uh, all the monsoon. In this specific case, is for the uh, Indian monsoon. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the um, water vapor source mainly come from air interaction, and air interaction always also uh, change the circulation pattern. And in many cases, the air interaction not only affect uh, uh, surface but also affect uh, circulation far away and in the uh, upper troposphere. So. Um, Talking about air interaction, it means different things to different people. Uh, in some cases, when people co correlate SSD patterns with atmospheric phenomena, they call that air interaction. And uh, sometimes people correlate as uh, atmospheric surface forcing, such as uh, surface wind or uh, energy input, to ocean circulation, and they call it uh, air interaction. And of course, many people run ARC coupled model and the diagnose model results, and they call that ARC interaction. But I hope you all agree that the core of ARC interaction is the exchange of energy, momentum, and the mass through the interface between ocean and atmosphere. So we simply call it ARC flux. Um, I think this is probably not new to some of you that uh, the atmosphere boundary layer is very important to air sea fluxes. Um, on the uh, 
left the figure illustrate when there's a deep convection, then the atmospheric boundary layer will be affected by many process related deep convection, such as uh, convective downdraft, treatment, and so on and so forth. That will change the surface property of the atmosphere and in turn will change ARC flux. In, uh, on the right hand side, the figure shows that uh, in non deep convective regime, sorry for interrupting. Uh, marine... I, I think, I think uh, uh, you have shared your presentation in your PC and you are watching your screen. Actually, organizers have shared the presentations on behalf of you. Uh, can you go to the um, uh, WebEx meet and? Okay. Uh, Oh, so you are you are showing the presentation? Yeah. Okay, so we're I mean, audience, uh, audience are seeing like this number screen. four, number three. Number three, okay. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Yeah, here we go. This is it. Yeah. So the ref is uh, deep uh, left is deep convective regime. The right hand side is the uh, shallow uh, convective regime. The the general uh, uh, message is the uh, there's a very dedicated and complicated uh, structure in the atmosphere that it will, would influence the air's interaction. Next, please. So in the ocean, we also know that the upper ocean structure is also very complicated and important to air sea fluxes. For example, we know we have um, fresh lands due to precipitation. We have a barrier layer due to uh, the uh, vertical stratification of um, salinity, and then we have uh, uh, thermocline. So these are all uh, very important to how ocean structure affect SST, then in turn affect IRC interaction. Next one, please. Typically, um, if you are oceanographer, um, the most common practice is to look at air sea fluxes and then look down to see what happened in the ocean. And if you are an atmospheric scientist, and typically you look at the surface flux and then look, you look upward to see what happened in the atmosphere. Um, very, very rarely actually we look at uh, surface flux and connect the surface flux to both the upper ocean and the lower uh, atmosphere, especially the boundary. Next, please. So this schematic just uh, demonstrates that there is uh, so many process in the upper ocean and in the atmospheric marine boundary layer that would affect air sea fluxes. And if you take the upper ocean air sea interface and the marine atmosphere boundary layer as a whole, you can define this as air sea transition zone. The key point is this is a single identity, not uh, a sum of the three different components. So that's the concept I want to introduce to you. Take the atmosphere, boundary layer, air, and upper ocean as a single identity, uh, which we can refer to as air sea transitions. Next one. Okay, so once we define air sea transition zone, I would suggest we will redefine air sea interaction. So based on this uh, air sea transition zone concept, air sea interaction does not happen only at the air sea interface. It actually happened through the entire column of the air sea transition zone. That means we have to consider the upper layer uh, ocean structure. We have to consider what happened at the air sea interface and we have to consider what happened in the atmosphere boundary layer. And the whole thing together, will define air sea interaction. So this is my main message. I hope from now on the air sea interaction is something happened in the entire air sea transition zone. Next please. From observational point of view, to observe the entire air sea uh, transition zone is very difficult. The most common practice will be use uh, research ship. And uh, from research ships, you can observe the atmosphere boundary layer use all different kinds of traditional instrument, radar, soundings, LIDAR, and so on and so forth. And you can also observe the upper ocean structure using CDTs and using uh, other new instruments. Uh, that, that is one of the standard way to observe the air sea transition. So, and in most, uh, I would say in comprehensive air sea interaction field campaign, we all have this component. Next one, please. Uh, hit again. 
Yes, no, yeah, this is good. Another way to observe the air sea transition zone is through aircraft drop zone. So that you can drop the um, uh, atmosphere drop zones and you can drop the ocean drop zone. So they can measure simultaneously the atmosphere profile and the upper ocean profile. So in this way, you can observe the entire air sea transition zone um, uh, at the same time. These are the two available way to observe the air-sea transition zone. They share the same issues. Number one, they're very, very expensive. Number two, uh, logistically, they're very challenging to arrange. So we have to uh, look beyond this traditional method to see whether there's other possibility to observe the air-sea transition zone. Next, please. Okay, so this illustrate some available observing technology and some observe possible observing technology in the future. So if you, let's go from left to the right, <clears throat> excuse me. On the left, that's all existing technology. So we have drop sound in the atmosphere, we have buoys, we have sail drones, that's the uh, red symbol. And in the ocean, we have ocean gliders, we have the um, uh, other uh, floats and the drifters, so on and so forth. So those are the existing capability. Then you move to, uh, uh, the right one, um, actually, we already start to put some more sophisticated instrument profiler uh, on buoys. For example, you can put um, upward looking LIDAR to observe the uh, wind structure in the boundary layer. And that has been done uh, for uh, the offshore wind industry. And you can put a, a sophisticated instrument to look the entire vertical structure of the, of the ocean. Then you move uh, further to the right, and you can imagine uh, we have an aerodrome. Uh, we can have a marine platform. The aerodrome can take off and landing on the platform to observe the uh, uh, vertical profiles of the boundary layer. And then you move to the far right. You can imagine we can have some uh, uh, futuristic technology. For example, we can have a robotic camera that it can stay on the surface to measure surface flux, take off to into the air to me measure the marine atmosphere boundary layer, and then submerge into the ocean to observe the upper ocean structure. So those are all the possibilities. Next one. So um, what we can do now, um, I can introduce you something we have done, not in the monsoon, a study, but in a tropical cyclone study that we have tried to use the sail drone, which is a robotic surface uh, vehicle, um, teamed up with the ocean gliders. And just in that case, we observe uh, both the atoms, the air sea interaction uh, at the air sea interface and the upper ocean uh, structures. And then we add on top of that aircraft drop sound so we can have the uh, vertical profile of the atmosphere. But in the future, we're going to try to add the uh, uncrewed uh, air drones and to team up with the sail drone at the surface and uh, uh, ocean gliders uh, in the ocean. So in that case, we can observe simultaneously the entire uh, vertical structure of the air sea transition zone. Next one. So this is basically my message is from now on, probably to advance air sea interaction studies in the monsoon, uh, cases or in general cases, uh, probably we should go beyond the traditional air sea, air sea fluxes. We, we need to observe the upper ocean, the air sea fluxes, and atoms around the layer. Call it at the same location at the same time. And that require uh, some new observing technology. Some of them we already have, some of them probably will have in the near future. That's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for very interesting and stimulating talk. So it, 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 it's open to questions from the audience. Oh, is there any questions? I'll check that. Okay, it is very stimulating. Are you planning uh, the such kind of uh, observation, field observation in near future? 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, in 2021, we already um, yes, used yes. the sail room yeah, and the glider to observe the hurricanes. Yes, uh, yes. And in, in this coming year, we're going to add air drones. And in the future, it depends on the uh, technology development. So we're going to continue practice uh, this uh, uncrewed or robotic measurement of the entire air sea transition zone in the field campaign. Okay, great. And how long can you observe? What is the span of the such kind of uh, observation? Okay, the sail drone can stay in the water up to 12 months if it, be, if, uh, it receives enough solar energy because it's driven by solar energy and the wind. Mm -hmm. So in the tropics, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the ocean gliders um, typically stay in the water from two weeks to maybe um, one or two months. Mm. Um, the, the, now the weak point is the air drone. The air drone uh, uh, time span is relatively short, and we do not have the, uh, the air drone that can fly from the ocean platform. So currently we're trying to experiment, experiment the air mm -hmm. drone that launched by aircraft. So we have this small uh, air drone launch by aircraft, then you can control it. So that's our next point. And I think eventually in the future, we should have some air drone that can, as I said, can land on the marine platform and take off automatically. Mm, sounds great, yeah. So you can have a, a good span of experiments. Okay, right. thank you very much again for a great talk. And I would like to thank all speakers in this session for providing a very good talks and good discussions. So this is the end of this session. So I'll, uh, so, Patanaik, yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, Yukari Madam. Yes, very nicely conducted session. And we had also very wonderful four talks. So it, so it is very, so we'll we'll uh, meet again for the parallel session in hall a and hall b that is a uh, 10 15 hours ist and 4 45 utc Till that time, so for five minutes break, five to seven minute break. So we'll split now into parallel session A and B. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.
हेलो ना जैसे ठीक है सर नमस्कार नमस्कार जस्ट मतलब चेक करने के लिए कि मेरा पीपीटी इसमें चल रहा है कि नहीं मैं करूं क्या अब कर लो दो तीन मिनट गैप है कर लो टेस्ट कर लो अभी ये मैंने शेयर किया हेलो दो दो सब आए क्या आएंगे कब ठीक है ठीक है स्लाइड सो मत देखो या ठीक है चेंज करो दूसरे पे जाओ थैंक यू मैडम यस फाइन मैडम ठीक है ठीक है सर थैंक यू सर ओके थैंक यू सर वन मोर थिंग सर वेल व्हेन यू गो टू द फुल स्क्रीन देयर इज अ बॉक्स कमिंग मिनिमाइज दैट बॉक्स सर हां मे आई ट्राई अगेन फॉर पुट इन द फुल स्क्रीन Oh, that has gone. Everything has gone. Good. Now we can see your presentations. Okay, no problem, sir. Now you can see. Yeah. Ah, but there is there are two boxes actually. One so, on the right, uh, one on the top. Yeah, correct. You can minimize it or you can close it. No issues. Okay, this ah uh, this one I will close. No. Ah, you yeah. can close. Okay, okay. Uh, when I will start my presentation, at that time I will close it. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, fine. okay sir. Thank you, sir. So, yes, sir. Everything fine. Hello, sir. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. Uh, yes, sir. thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Namaste, sir. Hi, sir. Um, yes, you can answer your. Uh, yeah, you can answer, please. Yeah, fine. So now let us uh, start this panel session hall A. So now may I request Dr. A K Sahay sir to kindly chair the session. And as you know, Sahay sir doesn't need any much introduction. Yes, he is very familiar face in extended range, and he has set up this thing, contributed WWRP, WCRP, many as a many leading committee members, and this is the thing. Yeah, you can see his bio data and S2S project. Uh, he is involved in many things, got also many awards, MOS award, Mosum award, ITM Golden Jubilee award, Silver Jubilee award, and also best paper, research yeah. paper for other yeah. climate science. So uh, I'll just not waste much time. So now it is over to Sahay Sahab to kindly start the proceeding. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. So there are actually six talks in this, uh, and I hope all six persons are there. So the time given is ten plus two minutes for discussion. Uh, if they will take twelve minutes, then there will be no discussion. So try to put it in uh, your things in ten minutes. So whether Sunita Pillai is there? I'm here only. I'm here only. Okay. Sir. So okay. so you can start your presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it my presentation is visible? Yeah, go to PowerPoint. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah, it is fine. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to interact with all of you. Um, uh, my my name is Sunita. I'm from Department of Meteorology and Oceanography from Andhra University. Uh, today I'm going to present my some of my results on Indian summer monsoon onset and the role of upper air circulation. Uh, so this is the motivation for my study. 
as you are already we know that indian monsoon onset is uh, significantly delaying and uh, uh, sometimes it's too too early and sometimes it's too delay uh, and it is mainly modulated by the enso and uh, iod phenomena from the pacific ocean as well as the indian ocean warming conditions you can see that from 1970 uh, 71 and 70, uh, 66 the mid latitude tropical uh, waves are much more influencing on the uh, pre monsoon conditions which is one of the significant influence on the monsoon onset Said. the the uh, movement of the quasi stationary waves also uh, like through rough troughs and ridges uh, uh, between uh, 55 degrees north to uh, along 50 degrees longitude and uh, there is a blocking high over the european uh, area is also influencing on the monsoon by considering of all these facts that uh, uh, in the present study i am going to uh, uh, you know, study the basic physical uh, mechanism, why the delay and early onset is happening with special reference to the mid latitude. In the present study, the shifting of the convective activities and the tropospheric temperature gradients and the moisture transport, uh, which is associated with the upper and lower level circulation, and all these studies are uh, uh, confined to this monsoon onset, uh, uh, monsoon to onset areas, and uh, also anomalous changes in the medianal Hadley cell circulation is also studied, and the relationship the convection and SST before the onset is also well studied through uh, in the present uh, delay and onset years. This is the schematic representation of the monsoon onset date and you can see that the first June is the uh, is the date for where we are receiving uh, the mon monsoon onset over Kerala region and subsequently this is the literature review because uh, for uh, for studying of any of the understanding of the physical mechanism we need the literature so monsoon onset is the one of the most singular weather phenomena uh, or indian region it begins on 31st according to anantan anant krishnan and soman uh, soman and kumar but the main artery feedback uh, what is the moisture feedback is coming from the 900 hectopascal through the cross equatorial flow as well as the low level jet stream activity and uh, that enhancement of the onset vortex is also based on this low level jet and there are a lot of studies uh, which contributed uh, you know significant increase of the net enthalpy latent heat energy and arabian sea in intensification of the cross uh, cross equatorial flow subtropical ridge uh, shifting and uh, apart from that uh, several scientific investigations also uh, contributed uh, the uh, monsoon onset uh, activity using uh, dynamical parameters like vertical integrated moisture flux normalized vegetation normalized uh, precipitation index olr uh, according to the Goswami and Xavier, they emphasize the change of the metroposphatic uh, te uh, meridional temperature gradient is one of the basic parameter to define, object to define the monsoon onset vertex. So these are the data sets that we consider for the monsoon onset. Uh, uh, monsoon onset dates are collected from the India Meteorological Annual Summer, summer Monsoon Reports from, and also from the past literature uh, to define the normal onset and uh, late onset and uh, uh, you know uh, early onset uh, based on these climatological changes, uh, monsoon onset dates as well as uh, uh, circulation changes, SST changes. Uh, according to the IMD criteria, we, we adapted this basic criteria. So first June is the monsoon onset uh, with a standard deviation of uh, seven days uh, from the uh, from the observations we came to know that uh, the extreme delay was observed in the 1958 and the extreme early onset was observed 14th may 1968 so the normal onset criteria is taken from 28th may to 3rd june uh, that, uh, 33 normal onset years are considered and uh, between 4th january to 27th may uh, sorry between 4th may to 27th may we consider uh, they are the early onset 19 uh, early onsets are considered and the late onsets are described uh, in between 4th june to 18th june uh, 21 uh, uh, late onset server uh, defined and uh, apart from that other uh, anal analysis fields are so considered uh, like for example uh, zonal and meridional limits and vertical velocity geo uh, uh, geopotential heights and air temperatures and uh, apart from that global precipitation uh, project rainfall data is also considered on daily basis uh, to identify the lead lag relationship between sst and convection olr and sst are also considered from the nova optimum 
calendar. These are the dates uh, that we uh, described for the monsoon onset in the early onset, herbal uh, onset, and late onset years. This is the methodology we consider. Uh, the first one is the vertical integrated moisture transport, uh, VIMT equal, uh, equal to 1 by C integral of surface to uh, 300 hectopascal QUDP. And uh, uh, another important one, wave activities flux is also considered from uh, Takya Nakumara in 2001 to identify the quasi-stationary Rossby wave interaction with the uh, monsoon onset. Uh, we want to check the statistical significance also, and we try to compose it the late onset and early onset for this composite analysis is performed. Lead lag relationships is also performed for the relationship between the SST and convection in the early and late onset. And finally, the correlation coefficient uh, is also fine identified uh, during this study. So coming to the basic characteristics of the convection and rainfall, uh, this is a uh, quite interesting uh, information. In the early onset, we can see the Western Pacific Bay of Bengal and Central Indian Ocean shows highest convection, uh, but whereas the suppressed convection is observed over Northwestern, uh, which, is, which is very significant at 99%, the contrasting features are observed in the late onset. So in the prominent convection is mainly observed over the Arabian of the Somali coast and Western Central Pacific Asia and Northwest Indian region. So coming to the rainfall, you can see the Bay of Bengal uh, receives highest rainfall in the early onset years, but uh, whereas in the late onset years, the Bay of Bengal uh, rainfall is decreasing. This is one type of uh, machinogil type response, uh, which alters the tropospheric temperature gradients. That's why we consider the uh, uh, tropospheric temperature also. So we averaged uh, in the pre-monsoon condition from 600 to 200 hectopascal over a period, uh, for the early and late onset and uh, you can see that erosion warming is prominently observed uh, uh, with a rise of temperatures 0.15 degrees centigrade to 0.43 degrees centigrade uh, and uh, persistent cooling was observed over the northwest and northern Indian uh, area and these reduced temperature gradients uh, so uh, further maintaining in the late onset years and a weak warming is observed over erosion region so uh, this important uh, uh, you know uh, uh, signal is uh, which, which is very confined due to the large scale substance of the anomalous walker circulation uh, which induced the sensible heat fluxes and vertical mixing during the uh, lanino uh, onset years past literature is also giving a, a clue for the uh, delay of the onset is mainly due to the Elino condition. So the decrease of convection and latent heat uh, release, cloudiness, winds and our surface fluxes, they always alters the temperatures over the Indian Ocean as well as the... Uh, coming to the low level circulation at 850 hectopascal, you can see that anomalous strong easterlies are prevailing over Western Arabian Sea and the Netherlands along the coast, uh, African coast, which will be contributing the weakening of the Somali jet stream. And also elongated uh, low level cyclonic circulation is, uh, 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 is prominent uh, from the Southern Arabian Sea, Central Bay of Bengal. So this, this is a, one of the important uh, information in the early sense onset when we observe this type of signal uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the coming days. So we can easily predict that it is a, one of the uh, uh, curse, precursor for the uh, early onset. But in the late onset, you can see the anomalous weak estelis are prevailing over the Eastern Arabia, Western Indian Ocean. So this is uh, quite uh, dramatic features mainly observed in the uh, uh, you know, negative IOD years. So this weakens the low level circulation. It is further shifting northward over the Arabian Sea. So this is a, one of the important feature what we observed in the low level circulation. Coming to the up, up, upper level circulation, uh, in the early in, in the early onset years, a strong upper vessels are prevailing, uh, as, especially from the mid-latitude. Uh, east of the Caspian Sea brings a, a lot of dry air and cold air to the northern part of the India with a cyclonic circulation and and uh, especially over the northwest region, this cyclonic circulation is the reason for the uh, break conditions uh, for the uh, over the Indian some uh, the Indian summer monsoon season. And uh, anti-cyclonic circulation is also established along the equatorial region. So this will be influencing the low-level circulations of the uh, Indian summer monsoon season at that time. So we can expect a break conditions also. So and at, at the same time, emergence of the strong anti-cyclonic circulation is also uh, over the Tibet region is very 
very important because shifting of the South Asian high is also associated with the Tibetan region uh, uh, anticyclonic circulation. So these early onset and uh, you know uh, these are mainly triggered by the mid latitude inclusion of the dry air in the upper level, which will modulate the circulation in the lower level. So that's why this is a very important information uh, from the upper level circulation. And apart from that, uh, the moisture transport is also equally important to understand uh, 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 after the weakening of the was. Uh, weakening of the circulation the moisture transport will be also weakening so along 10 degrees north to 20 degrees north this uh, circulation is uh, i mean this transport is very limited uh, this is also very much uh, understood in the southern uh, southwestern arabian sea uh, the moisture transport is very high in the late onset year so vertical integrated moisture is also very important the moisture feed is not sufficient from the surface to 900 hectopascal this could be the reason for the early onset uh, uh, and uh, during uh, uh, late onset years, the, the shifting of the activities, so maintaining of the metropospheric moisture is also equally important. That is happening in the late onset year. Coming to the equal uh, wave activity flux, there are two types of uh, uh, phases will be there. One is the positive phase and second one is the negative phase. The positive phase is always associated with the eastward propagation from east Iran to uh, Iran to the northwest Pacific Ocean and western okay. Yes, sir. yes, 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 sir. So, in the early onset, this positive phase is shifting to the Bonin Islands, which is penetrating the westerlies from the uh, mid latitude. This could be the reason for the dampening of the upper level cold temperatures for the West Asia. So, uh, the existence of anticyclonic phenomena and subtropical ridge at 50 degrees east is uh, crucial for the uh, Caspian, or the Caspians is crucial for the, uh, you know, uh, onset phenomena. And uh, coming to the Hadley circulation, dampening is also very important. Uh, we can see the weakening of the uh, uh, Hadley circulation is observed both in early onset as well as in the late onset. Coming to the relationship between S convection and SST during early onset, you can see that the high SST leads to the enhanced convection, uh, enhanced SST, and whereas the lower OLR, uh, that is enhanced convection, is uh, lagging uh, the, uh, after some time because of the atmospheric asymmetries. And uh, this is the large difference between SST forcing and response time over the Arabian Sea. And uh, this is for the moderate uh, onset years. Uh, you can see that uh, this will be happening uh, uh, around uh, first first June. And coming to the late Ju late uh, late onset years, uh, this relationship holds good in the um, mid of the June month. So that's why we are getting uh, a late uh, onset uh, late onset years. Uh, so you can see the relationship between the SST and convection in monsoon onset extremes. The quotient of correlation is paused to and peak in the early. Onset onset years in the uh, early May and uh, whereas in the late onset years we can see the uh, delay of the onset so this holds good this is the schematic representation of the early onset and late onset uh, uh, using a uh, different parameters and uh, these are the, my conclusions based on the available monsoon onset uh, uh, it's already I explained uh, about all this information and uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention thank you Thank you, Professor Sunita. Are there yeah. any questions? Yes. So, if not, uh, uh, let us thank yes. Professor Sunita. And, thank and uh, now the second talk will thank. be by. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank Ramesh. you very much. So, Ramesh, can you start your? Professor Sunita, you want to say? Yeah, your... Yes, 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 sir. I stopped my feed. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning to all of you. Can you hear me? Is yeah. it okay? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So. Uh, uh, I am Ramesh Kumar Yadav. Now I am going to uh, talk about the relationship between uh, Jor High and Indian summer monsoon. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> you are, you are 
Uh, okay, so uh, you know that uh, uh, that during summer time, uh, Azure High in the North Atlantic has uh, is much bigger in shape and in strength. So if you compare from winter to season, you can see that uh, in which uh, in winter in the North Atlantic there is uh, this uh, Atl uh, Icelandic low and Azure High, but. Uh, um, with summer, it becomes very big and it uh, its strength is also very high. So there is a common thing between Azure High and Indian summer monsoon that uh, uh, Indian rainfall that uh, both of them peaks during summer. So I thought that there must be some relationship between these two. <clears throat> and also we know that uh, Indian summer monsoon uh, at the surface, there is a strong convergence and at the upper troposphere, there is a large scale outflow that that creates a large scale divergence and also we know that uh, the shift of this divergence will cause uh, the shift of this monsoon in the sense that the upper level divergence will start this upper level uh, motion and that upper level monsoon will uh, will create lower uh, lower level convergence and that convergence will attract this moisture and again uh, with this moisture latent heat and other things will start and like that uh, that monsoon will <coughs> will see, uh, will uh, revive so <coughs> so to start means uh, i will start with the climatology here in this figure you can see that <coughs> uh, this explains the uh, 200 hpa 200 hpa uh, geopotential height and um, divergence so over the Indian region, there is a strong, uh, it is showing upper um, strong divergence because of this monsoon. And uh, this, this contour represents the Tibetan high. So uh, it, it spans from <clears throat> northwest of uh, Pacific to this North uh, Africa. And over this region, over Atlantic, you can see there is a strong convergence. And also over this North Pacific, there is a strong convergence over this region because of this uh, azure high and uh, this subtropical high over here and this represents the 200 hpa vorticity and 200 hpa wind this contour represents the asian uh, jet stream and this uh, this this represents the uh, american jet stream so over this north atlantic you can see there are two jet stream present <laughs> during summer season and because of this jet stream uh, north of this jet stream there will be positive vorticity and south of it there will be negative vorticity so because of this two jet stream you can see that uh, over this north At atlantic uh, there is a quadruple type of a structure and uh, this type of thing is not present in any part of the world so so uh, this represents that uh, during summer that uh, north atlantic is more vibrant and it should be studied and uh, it it is having a potential to influence the weather and climate uh, remotely means uh, uh, <clears throat> over the other part of the globe and this shows the 200 hpa rossby web source and rossby web activity flux so you can see that uh, this rossby web activity flux uh, is uh, rotated along the globe uh, around this uh, 45 degree latitude and um, at the upper troposphere where there is convergence over this north atlantic and north pacific that these are the regions of rossby web source also because uh, uh, because of this upper level convergence it will be um, in the rossby web uh, source equation uh, divergent is one of the parameter and because of that uh, upper level convergence will be the source of that rossby web so, and in this study, I have considered uh, upper, uh, different height for, for uh, stropopos height. Um, so, uh, this is because that uh, zonal wind is maximum at 200 HPA, divergent is maximum at 250 HPA, like that vorticity is maximum at 250 HPA, and yeah, uh, burnt vessel of frequency, which represents the unstable of the atmosphere, is maximum at 300 HPA. So, in this study, I have considered different heights for this tropopause. Uh, and this is because of um, this is just to show that 
So now with the recent data set, recent uh, four decade, recent data set that is starting from 1979 to 2019, I have done the EOF analysis for this region, excluding this Northeast India because of uh, excessive loading and out of his relationship with all India rain, uh, rainfall. And that corresponding CC, uh, that uh, correlation with uh, this rainfall, uh, IMD rainfall source, positive rainfall over this uh, Western and Central India and negative rainfall uh, over this uh, Northeast India. So basically there is a dipole type pattern over this region. And uh, uh, in the recent four decades that monsoon is shifting westward. Now, <clears throat> That correlation with upper uh, 200 HPA um, geo potential, you can see that these are the center of actions which uh, which are showing maximum correlation. This is over northwest of India. This is from um, over that uh, North Africa, and this is over East Asia. This one over uh, North America, and this one uh, over North Europe. So these are <clears throat> basically the uh, CGT pattern circum global teleconnection pattern and this is uh, because of this monsoon desert relationship and here you can see this is new and this is over this north atlantic region at the same place where that uh, that azure high is situated during this season and at the lower tropos uh, at the, uh, at the lower troposphere when i correlated with mean sea level pressure and 800 hpa wind you can see that again i am getting the significant correlation over North Atlantic that is at the same place over that uh, azure high. So uh, with the recent data set, recent four decade uh, data set, uh, what we are saying that 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 first dominant mode is uh, strongly is uh, related with this azure high. Now uh, that uh, we know, uh, now I have considered this uh, uh, box over this region, over this mean sea level pressure and extracted the data just to represent that azure high and then again correlated with 200 HP <laughs> geopotential height. So you can see that here it is negative correlation, positive, negative, positive. So this uh, basically represents the Eurasian Rossby wave and over this North Atlantic, there is a dipole type of a structure. So this is basically because of that uh, uh, over this extra tropical uh, extra tropic the atmosphere is equivalent better tropic so that uh, the the high pressure over this azure high will be same will have the same uh, same signature at the upper troposphere and this is over this tropics so tropics we know that uh, the atmosphere is baroclinic so this uh, high pressure area uh, at the uh, surface will will become negative pressure area over here. And uh, in the earlier studies, I have shown that this is also um, the source of Rossby waves so, uh, over this North Atlantic. And this anticyclone, what it will do that it will intensify the Asian jet stream, which emanates, which or, uh, originate over this place, over this North Atlantic. And this negative, uh, <coughs> negative anomaly will also intensify the jet uh, Asian jet stream over here. So, so uh, actually, uh, this uh, Azure High is intensifying this uh, jet stream, and we know that jet stream acts as a wave guide. So, uh, this low frequency <coughs> variability, which is introduced into this jet stream, will travel from this North Atlantic to to to, to uh, North India. And also, jet testing uh, is is mm, favorable for this uh, Indian summer monsoon. Side to so, uh, uh, okay. uh, so further, I I have collected with 500 uh, HPA omega, which represents the um, subsidence motion, which, and that is obvious because uh, a strong azure high means there uh, will intensify this uh, uh, mid tropospheric subsidence and that subsidence will uh, intensify this upper um, upper troposphere convergence and that convergence will intensify this uh, Rossby wave source. And uh, this is 200 HPA and vorticity and 300 HPA burn, burn vertical frequency uh, correlation. So here you can see that, that uh, 
this represents basically the um, asian jet stream and because of that this uh, uh, this uh, uh, it will uh, means uh, uh, that unstable air will be along this jet stream from this north atlantic to indian region and this is for the composite for uh, excess years and deficient years so uh, uh, in the excess years you can see that uh, there is a dipole type of structure over this north atlantic and this uh, rossby waves are also strong and here because of this dipole structure this uh, tibetan high pore will be shifted uh, westward and that's why because uh, that monsoon will be shifted westward while during the deficient years you can see that here that the uh, dipole type structure is missing because that azure high uh, is much weaker and its uh, expansion will not be up to this uh, uh, tropical region and also this Rossby wave source are, uh, Rossby waves is much weaker. So during this uh, uh, deficient years, the the influence of this azure high will be uh, very minimum over this north uh, over Indian summer monsoon. But while during a strong year, uh, a strong years means that influence will be much higher. And this is the EO analysis over this region. And this second EO analysis uh, represents the. Uh, Second, EOF represents the similar type pattern, this positive anomaly over here, negative, negative, and this positive. And it is very uh, highly correlated with azure high. So this, uh, this type of a structure do exist over this region. And uh, for more details, you can just go through this paper. And if you have question, I, am, I will be happy to. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Ramesh. Uh, I don't see there is any question, but it is very good presentation and uh, a lot of new things are there. So I think we have to go for the uh, next presentation by Varunesh Chandra. Good morning. Uh, please. Can you hear, sir? Yeah, we can hear, but you share your slides. Yeah, fine. Go to slide some more. Yes, sir. it is visible, sir. Yeah, now it is. Visible. Thank you. So, good morning, all of you. My name is Varnes Sanda. I am PhD student at IIT Delhi. So, <clears throat> now I'm going to present the topic entitled Decline in the Indian Sun Monsoon. The monsoon synoptic activity in the response to the Arctic and the Antarctica sea ice melt. So, so basically, my PhD is related to the uh, how this polar sea ice melt influencing the tropical climate, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Indian summer monsoon, RTCZ, and the low pressure system. So for addressing this uh, project, I am doing a lot of uh, uh, I am doing the different type of experiment in which I have changed the uh, sea ice over the Arctic and Antarctica, which I present the today and the other. Uh, other experiment where I have changed the uh, sea ice only the Arctic and other experiment where I changed the uh, sea ice over the Antarctica. So, uh, 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 outline of talk today, introduction, motivation, motivation, experiment, details, and the result. And uh, uh, finally, I will end up with the summary. So, introduction. So, uh, so I have taken this figure from uh, IPCT 2013. So, you can see, uh, this is the actually surface temperature train. So, uh, you can see here the, the surface is increasing, uh, surface temperature is increasing in over over the whole globe, especially more increasing over the uh, higher latitude in the northern and the southern hemisphere. In the below, this is the time series of, of temperature of uh, red one is the Arctic and the black ones are uh, uh, global. So uh, you can see here the Arctic warming that twice as fast as a global Everest. So it's mean the polar uh, uh, temperature increasing is more than the globe. So if the uh, temperature will be increased, so it, it will be impact on the sea ice melt. Sea ice melt will be increased, so albedo will be decreased. Albedo will be decreased, so it, it will be effect on the energy absorption. So ocean will be absorbed more sorbet sort of radiation. So it will be in, again affect the uh, heat content. So ocean heat content will be increased. So this heat content will be again the push of the temperature. This is the amplification of warming. This is also known as the AA, Arctic amplification. So if the Arctic amplification will be increased more, so it can be impact on atmospheric circulation as well as the oceanic circulation. If the atmospheric and oceanic circulation will be disturbed, 
uh, disturbed, then it can impact the regional as well as the global climate system. So this is the last fourth extreme event. This is a very famous picture from the Uttarakhand floods. So I am not saying this is extreme event is happening due to the, this uh, Arctic sea ice melt, but somehow it is related from that. So we have already known that the equator received the most short wave radiation in compared to the polar region. So this uh, uh, this uh, actually a surplus of uh, energy is transferred towards the pool through the uh, this uh, 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 atmospheric and the oceanic circulation. So uh, this this energy actually uh, 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 transferred through uh, delta T. This is the uh, temperature gradient. Uh, delta T means the temperature within the equator and the poles. So uh, we have already know the sea ice is melting. So if the sea ice is melt, so ocean or the polar ocean is absorb more salt radiation. Radiation is it it will absorb the more salt radiation. Then it 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 can push up the temperature. So polar region temperature will be increased more. So this delta T delta T between the equator and pole that will be the weak. If the gradient will be weak, then the energy from transfer to the uh, equator to pole that will be actually. Uh, 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 decrease so energy uh, uh, transformation uh, transfer is decreased so it can affect on the atmospheric and the oceanic circulation if the circulation will be disturbed then it can be impact on the region as well global climate system so it was the our initial hypothesis for the doing this project now i will go to the motivation so i have actually put it uh, uh, this result here because it is very similar to my result so it is published by the uh, 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 sandeep it in 2018 it is he is my supervisor so actually he showed that the, in the warming climate the low pressure system is decreasing and the circulation is also weakening this is i have taken the figure from the ipcc a55 in the upper panel it's showing for the northern hemisphere in the below panel showing the southern hemisphere so this is the actually arctic sea ice extent in, the, in a different scenario so in a warming scenario is in rcp 8.5 either that is showing the red uh, uh, you can see here uh, the, in the all uh, uh, in the in the both hemisphere the arctic uh, sorry uh, the sea ice extent is decreasing so uh, this is our uh, 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 for motivation for doing uh, this project uh, so what will be happen if the sea ice melt uh, will be in the both hemisphere in the tropical climate so we have done the coupled uh, and uncoupled simulation from the ancar csm model where i have changed the albedo of the arctic and antarctica uh, 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 and this is actually these uh, settings are similar to the Lee and the Federal 2019. So I have already told I have used the in uh, CSM 1.2 point uh, uh, 1.2 uh, coupled uh, fully coupled uh, model uh, in which I have run the 350 years. I have used the pre-industrial uh, forcing in the experiment. I have changed the albedo over the both hemisphere and run for the 50. Years. This actually branch uh, branch of uh, run up 300 year of control experiment. So uh, this was very coarse uh, uh, resolution. So uh, uh, around the two degrees, so it is very difficult to track the low pressure system from the these experiment. So we have learned, uh, we have again uh, run for uh, high resolution AGCM simulation uh, around the 50 kilometers with the help of these forcing. So I have taken the CI concentration and the SST from the last 10 years uh, from these coupled simulation. Uh, last 10 years, this means 341 to 350. So I have run the eight uh, assembled runs from the AGCM simulation. So starting four uh, uh, assembles for the four years and, uh, and last in four assembles for the two years. Uh, yeah, I have already told about these things. So this is the eight assembles uh, starting four years, four years uh, runs and the last four years for two years. So uh, uh, I, it has been done by the slightly perturbing the initial surface of four for the both experiments. So I have used the Praveen ETR 2005 uh, 2015 tracking algorithm, algorithm used, used to track the low pressure system from these experiments. So now I will go to coupled simulation results. So this is the last 10 years uh, 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 CIS concentration, climatology CIS concentration, which I have forced to use the addition simulation. This is the annual mean climatology of CIS concentration. So you the sided one is, is the CIS concentration from the uh, 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 our simulation, and the, this is the black contour is uh, uh, from the uh, uh, head SIS CIS concentration. So you can see this is from control, this is a CIS melt experiment, and this is a difference. Uh, CIS melt and control. So you can see uh, the upper panel for the Arctic and the below is this, this is Antarctica. So you can see here the 50% CIS uh, concentration decreasing in both hemisphere. 
and uh, the, this is the actually seasonal cycle of sea ice concentration over the arctic and the antarctica the solid line is showing the, the semi 5 sea ice concentration rcp 8.5 this is the actually climatological mean of uh, 2081 to 2100 and this is the blue solid line is from the 1981 to 200 and uh, this our, our simulation so you can see here it is very interesting and this is the similar pattern with the semi 5 in the both hemisphere and uh, this is the ssd from the our coupled model simulation so you can see this is control uh, contour is uh, showing the control uh, ssd sea surface temperature and uh, this is added on the difference so you can see here the uh, 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 the uh, um, warming over all ocean basin with stronger warming over the tropical ocean basin and uh, uh, this is the actually a mock uh, so uh, uh, Atlantic media over circulation for control and the difference. So you can see here uh, that MOP is weakening the sea ice melt experiment. So I have already told that if the sea ice will be melt though, so uh, it will can impact on the uh, 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 atmospheric and oceanic circulation. So you can see here the oceanic circulation is weakening. So now it can and can impact on the regional as well as global climate system. Now I will show the addition simulation results. So uh, this is. Uh, 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 this is standard one. This is the LPS track density, JGS mean, assemble mean LPS track density from the hour simulation. And the this contour is showing from the era entry. And uh, this is the CI smart. And the, this is the difference. So you can difference plot in, you can see that the LPS uh, track density is decreasing. Uh, in the sea ice melt experiment and and, and and it is also showing a north south dipole like this structure in the track density chains with strong weakening uh, 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 over the south and strengthening over the north it is very interesting because it is very similar to a uh, result uh, uh, with reported by the sandeep in 2018 i have already showed and earlier and this actually results suggest that response of monsoon synoptic activity to polar sea ice melt is similar to its response to increase the radiative uh, forcing and this is the number of uh, uh, LPS days in the LPS days is also uh, decreasing with in compared to the control simulation. And this is the category of different storms. So you can see here low depression, deep depression, and the cyclonic storm and sub cyclonic storm. So low and depression, it also decreases this red one from the sea ice melt experiment. So you can see here low and depression is also decreasing in the uh, low uh, uh, in the sea ice melt experiment, but deep depression there is not much changing. This is the actually the uh, the uh, this uh, uh, vector is showing the wind and the, the uh, sided one is showing the absolute vorticity. So you can see uh, from the control and and this is from the sea ice melt experiment and this is a different. So you can see here uh, the circulation is also weakening and the absolute varsity is decreasing. So we have already know that the absolute varsity is uh, very necessary for the genesis of low pressure system. So it is the main reason for uh, decreasing the low pressure system. Uh, uh, over Let's the try to finish. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So uh, uh, and and this is the uh, uh, JGS mean assembled mean relative humidity as the 50 head detector Pascal. So you can see uh, in the upper panel is the relative humidity and the upper lower panel is is the uh, uh, vertical wind shear. So you can uh, uh, you can see here there's a difference of uh, absolute vorticity. There is a uh, decreasing over the uh, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, uh, and uh, but it is not significantly uh, decreasing uh, over the uh, monsoon uh, monsoon low pressure uh, uh, genesis location. So uh, this is not contributing to the weakening of Melchior's activity in the Camp Five experiment. But if you will see the wind is uh, uh, vertical wind shear, this is the strengthening over the uh, reason of the low pressure system so so uh, uh, these uh, results suggest that the strong Albert care CL also has a play a role in the weakening of LPS activity in the sea ice melt experiment so now as a summary the global sea ice melt is shown to affect the tropical climate uh, uh, primarily through the ocean dynamics our results show that the Indian summer monsoon circulation would weaken the significantly in the response to the global sea ice melt further the monsoon LPS that are responsible for the more than half continental Indian rainfall weakened and undergo a northward shift in the sea ice melt uh, simulation. The changes in the low level absolute varsity and the vertical shear over the Bay of Bengal explain the changes in the LPS activity in response to the polar sea ice melt. Overall, the changes in the Indian monsoon uh, circulation and the LPS activity in the response to polar, uh, sorry, response, uh, 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 response to the polar sea ice uh, melt. Overall, the uh, uh, these indicate that the polar sea ice melt might amplify the effect of radiative forcing due to the enhanced greenhouse gas emission. So thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Thank you. Okay.
thank you thank you very nice so uh, this uh, polar sea ice melt you have shown for both the poles actually yes sir okay so okay so in the global warming scenario monsoon will be weakening yes sir good any question but sir this is only the isolate effect of the uh, i have only changing the or uh, not changing the any greenhouse gas anything i am changing yeah, yeah, fine, this fine, is actually fine. effect yeah. of the sea ice melt on tropical climate only, yeah, not yeah, global yeah, warming okay. thank you yes thank you so is there any question uh, from anyone no okay so the next thank you varnesh so next talk thank will you be thank you so much sir by hero kazu endo uh can you start yeah fine are you here yeah. can you see no, we can see you okay so okay yeah yeah so so i i start my talk so thank you chairman hello everyone my name is hirokazu endo of mri in japan today's my talk is different future changes between early and late summer monsoon precipitation in East Asia. East Asian summer climate is characterized by the May by rain band. That is one of the Asian monsoon phenomena. The rain band is formed by interaction of low level monsoonal flow with the upper level East Asian vessel jet and the rain band migrates northward may from May to July in East Asia. Due to the exist existence of the rain band, a lot of monsoon rainfall is observed not only over the continent but also over the ocean, including Japan. A recent study shows the East, East Asian westerly jet uh, anchors the rain band by advecting warm air at mid, at mid troposphere to induce adiabatic upward motion and also by guiding transient disturbances. Here, I briefly review studies of future changes in Asia summer monsoon. Asia monsoon precipitation is projected to increase overall, and its, its change rate is larger than that in other monsoon regions. A moisture increase due to a warming enhanced monsoon precipitation, while stabilized atmosphere has a negative impact on precipitation change through a weakening of monsoon circulation. However, the negative dynamic effect is much smaller in Asia than that in other regions, resulting in a remarkable increase, remarkable increase in precipitation. Actually, low-level monsoonal flows are enhanced near the Eurasian continent. The following studies reveal, revealed a significant role of a land, land warming on the Asian monsoon response. Coupled model projects uh, a remarkable up, upper level warming in the tropics and uh, a tropospheric warming over the Eurasian continent. The upper level warming that is explained by a uniform SST warming weakens monsoon saturation. However, tropospheric warming over the continent that is explained by a direct effect of CO2 increase enhances monsoon saturation through intensifying, intensifying the land sea summer contrast. We have conducted global warming projections with a high resolution MRI AGCM for obtaining reliable future projection of extreme phenomena and regional climate. The AGCM is forced by prescribed SSTs that, that comes from observation or AOGCM anomalies. This MIP type experiment can avoid large biases originating from the SST bias in AOGCM, enabling us to obtain realistic regional climate. From here, I will show you the result. We conducted two sets of ensemble projections to cover a wide range of uncertainties. First is a multi-SST ensemble uh, that covers various SST change patterns in CMIP-5 projections. Second is a multi-physics and multi-SST ensemble 
where three different cumulus convection schemes and four different SSD patterns are employed. The result shows that summer precipitation is increased overall, but there are large subseasonal and regional variations. In June, the Mayu Bayou Renband is intensified and its eastern part shifts southward, which are robust within the simulations. In July and August, precipitation is increased over northern China and neighboring seas while precipitation changes small over the Pacific in August. However, in July, there is no consensus on the projection of the Mayu by Rainbow. In order to understand these future changes, we conducted sensitivity experiments with AGCM. The experiments are designed to isolate four kinds of factors listed here. The first factor is the direct effect of greenhouse gas increase, which is often called the first response, which warms the land and consequently enhances the monsoon circulation. And the other factors are SST related changes, which is often called the slow response, and which is separated into uniform, uh, separated into three parts, uh, uniform SST warming and uh, SSD pattern change in the tropics and SSD pattern change in the northern hemisphere. This is the result of precipitation change. In June, the response to all four things is mainly, the, by, uh, mainly explained by the effect of the uniform SSD warming and the tropical SSD pattern change. However, in July and August, other factors uh, greenhouse gas induced land warming and uh, the SST pattern change in the northern hemisphere are influential. So the result suggests that the relative importance of these, these four factors is different between early and late summer. This is a response of upper level westerly jet that is important background in seasonal migration of the rain band. The total response has a clear seasonality. The East Asian jet is strengthened and shifted southward in June, while it is somewhat uh, weakened in late summer. The sensitivity experiments show the uniform SST warming and the tropical SST pattern change intensify the East Asian jet and shift it southward throughout the summer season. However, the effect of greenhouse gas land warming and uh, northern hemisphere SSD pattern change intense, uh, mm, yeah, this uh, effect emerge in late summer and uh, oppose and exceed the effect of the other two factors. So this resulting in, uh, this result in a clear seasonality of the total response. So, understand it. for understanding the East Asian jet response, surface temperature changes are analyzed. Total response show a clear uh, mid latitude warming in late summer, which weaken the meridional summer gradient around. Two minutes summer. more. Two minutes more, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, which weaken the meridional summer gradient around Japan resulting in a weakening of the East Asian jet through thermodynamic summer wind balance. The mid-latitude warming in late summer is explained by greenhouse gas-induced land warming and a large SST warming in mid-latitude. These changes seem, seem to be constrained by the seasonal cycle of the climatology with an amplification of the magnitude especially for SSP. These changes are possibly connected by uh, via land atmosphere ocean interactions. So in summary, future projections with the MRI AGCM show summer precipitation in East Asia will increase overall, but large subseasonal and regional variations are noted. In early summer, 
the simulations consistently project intensified mayu by rain band with it, its eastern part shifted southward, where the effect of SST warming and tropical SST pattern change dominate. In late summer, precipitation is increased in northern China and the neighboring seas, while there is no consensus on the projection of the mayu by rain band in July. We found the effect of greenhouse gas induced land warming and large SST warming in latitude are important for these changes, and they oppose and exceed the early, early, early summer effect. Our study highlights a distinct seasonality of future changes in East Asian summer precipitation, which is explained by the balance of these four factors, and the results suggest a competition between the opposing factors makes the signal of the May by band response smaller in July than in June. Yeah, that's that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Hirakazu. Uh, are there any questions? No, okay. Thanks. Thanks for a nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, presentation will be by Dr. Sushmita Joseph. So, Dr. Joseph, please, you can start. Is my screen visible? Uh, no, not yet. Yeah, now it is. Okay. So, again, yeah. Okay. So, greetings everyone. Uh, myself, Susmita Joseph from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Uh, my uh, talk is on the changing characteristics of monsoon intraseasonal oscillations in a warming climate. So, this paper is published recently in TAC, uh, and uh, these are my collaborators. So, the motivation behind the study is that uh, in the recent uh, periods, the global warming has risen substantially. And a few recent studies indicate that the Indian summer monsoon is also showing an increasing trend in the recent period. And they attribute this uh, to the rising trend in the warming land and oceans. So in this backdrop, uh, it is expected that the monsoon intraseasonal oscillations, which are the building blocks of Indian summer monsoon, would also exhibit uh, spatial and temporal variability. And uh, there could be an increased frequency of the extreme events. So, here uh, we can see that uh, the in the recent period, so this is the difference between the recent period and the uh, earlier period. Uh, so here you can see that uh, both the seasonal rainfall as well as the intra-seasonal uh, activity, they both are sharing a commonality in their spatial structure. So uh, there are many studies uh, who have uh, analyzed the Meso characteristics in the recent periods, but uh, uh, none of them have uh, checked it in the basis of the duration of these spells, that is the short duration and long duration active break spells. So in this study, uh, we want to examine the changes that happened in the short duration as well as the long duration active break spells uh, in the early 21st century compared to the late 20th century. So this is the year-to-year -year variability in the number of short and long active break spells during this period. So here we can see that uh, the long spells have increased in the recent period, uh, both the number as well as the number of spells, number of days as well as the number of spells. And uh, it, the a number has increased for the break spells as well. But uh, when we go to the short duration spells, we can see that both the actives and breaks are uh, have reduced in their number. And uh, this uh, decrease in the short actives is uh, 49 percentage and uh, the increase in the long active is 42 percentage. So these are uh, significant. Coming to the breaks, uh, both the increase in the uh, long duration spells and the decrease in the short duration spells are 32 percentage. So coming to the composite rainfall anomalies for uh, these uh, long and short um, active break spells for the two periods and the lower panel shows the difference uh, that is statistically significant values are only plotted here. So here we can see that in the recent period uh, there is a uh, intensification of uh, the positive rainfall anomalies over this western parts of the country 
and this is also there in the long duration spells compared to the previous period so if this in the recent period that the short duration spells are much more intense over this uh, region so coming to the break spells uh, we can see that we don't see much difference in their spatial pattern but uh, when we see the long breaks we can see that a slight uh, weakening of this break spells is seen over this western parts this uh, figure shows the hardly circulation during these two periods uh, and here also we can see that uh, this in the um, late period that is the in the recent period the intensification is there more over this region and we can see that the there is uh, even the difference also shows that there is an increased ascent over this uh, around 20 degree north which was consistent with the previous figure so in uh, when we see the break spells also we can see that especially over the um, long long spells the break spells have weakened over this uh, western parts uh, which we were we were seeing that is to the 20 degree north so this also confirms the intensification of the active spells and weakening of the break spells around this 20 degree north in the recent period so coming to the moisture as well as uh, the vertically integrated moisture transport up to 500 HPA. So this in the recent period, we can see that uh, the moisture transport has increased much. And uh, in the if you remember, uh, last day, Dr. Patnai had given a talk that he also told that even over this uh, Arabian Sea region, the moisture transport and uh, the, uh, is more over this region. And uh, this is giving the more uh, number of spells over this region. So here, when we see for the short and uh, long active uh, break spells also, we can see that when we are going for the difference, there is an increased moisture over uh, this region, over the western parts. This also supports that uh, the uh, break spells are weakened uh, over this region. Coming to the low level uh, convergence and upper level divergence. So low level divergence uh, convergence has also increased over the Arabian Sea and it is slightly uh, not that strong in the Bay of Bengal region. And uh, coming to the upper level divergence also, we can see that uh, over the Arabian Sea, it is uh, there, but uh, for the Bay of Bengal region, the upper level divergence has decreased. So these factors can actually uh, decline the formation of the monsoon low pressure systems, as well as their further intensification into the monsoon depressions, uh, which could also lead to a reduction in the occurrence of active spells over this uh, central and eastern parts of the country. Now, another uh, thing which we noticed in our study is that uh, the active and break spells, uh, the long spells are more in the recent period. So we just uh, analyzed what could be the reason for this lengthening of these spells. So here we can, uh, we, this is just the sparse spectra of the JJS rainfall over the monsoon zone region of India. So here we can see that in the earlier period, the power was not that much and the periodicity was also less. But uh, in the recent period, we can see that both the periodicity as well as the power of the JGS rainfall has increased. So uh, when we see the OLR anomaly over this um, Indian region and our adjoining regions, so we can see that in the recent period, that is, uh, there, is uh, there is an alternating pattern of uh, positive and negative anomalies over this equatorial region. And uh, there was some earlier study which showed that uh, the equatorial MGO plays an important role in lengthening the break spells. So we just uh, wanted to see whether um, this MGO is having any role in this uh, lengthening of this active as well as break spells. So we just uh, plotted these uh, Euler anomalies. And when we see uh, closely over the equatorial region, uh, especially the east-west circulation over the Phi North to Phi South region, so here we can see that there is an alternating pattern of the negative and positive OLR anomalies and uh, corresponding to the suppressed and increased convection. Uh, so this could be an indication of the uh, eastward propagating MGO in the equatorial region. So further, we plotted the uh, homular diagram for the different regions, that is the Phi South to Phi North average. Uh, so here also we can see that in the recent period, there is an alternating pattern of uh, positive and negative convection anomalies and this is also there uh, they are not much stronger in the short spells and also in the earlier periods so then uh, in that earlier study uh, we had shown that uh, the uh, mgo is a kelvin rossby couplet and so when this is moving in the equatorial region 
the divergent part of the Rossby wave that moves to the Indian land and couples with the already existing break condition, and it, uh, it was intensified. So in similar lines, we plotted the westward, uh, we can see the westward propagation over this region because earlier figure we have seen that there is an elongation of this uh, rain bands that is the quadruple structure we generally call. So that is evident for these two uh, spells, both uh, long actives and long spells, uh, break spells. So here we can see that this westward propagation is there from the maritime continents to the central Indian region. So that when couples with the uh, already existing anomalies over the active or break spells over this Indian region, so that gets intensified. So we were wondering why this uh, MGO is having a role in the recent uh, spells or the lengthening of the spells. So we just saw the wave number frequency spectrum analysis of uh, this is the seasonal feature. So for the two periods, and it is clearly indicating that in the recent years, the MGO has indeed intensified and even the westward component is also much more stronger compared to the earlier period. So in the recent, uh, there are some uh, recent studies which shows that uh, the because of this global warming, that the SSTs has warmed up in the warm cold region. And here we can see in this figure also, that is over this region, uh, this is the place where the MGOs are much more stronger and uh, evident. So here, uh, because of this increased SSTs over this region, there are more uh, prevalence, or there is more prevalence of this uh, equatorial MGO. And this could be the reason why we are having more influence of MGO over the- uh, two, two more minutes. Yeah. So these are my conclusions. So this is already described that uh, there is an east-west asymmetry in the rainfall patterns. And this was explained uh, because of the increasing temperatures over the oceanic and land areas. There is an increased diabetic heating over the western parts, which in turn increases the instability and moisture convergence and moisture transport. This further intensify the circulation and rainfall, leading to the intense and long living active spells and gel break spells over the western region. Coming to the uh, long duration spells, as I told, the MGO has an influence and they uh, influence the northward propagating active break spells through the westward moving convergent or divergent Rossby waves emanating from this Kelvin Rossby couplet. So this can uh, lengthen the active and break spells. So, but uh, we also understand that the monsoon is a complex uh, system and it has a lot of uh, interactions involved in that and a combination of different favorable and unfavorable factors uh, could be instrumental in generating these uh, observed features. And uh, so uh, the dedicated sensitivity experiments using the models would be required to bring out the role of each of them in regulating these characteristics, which is not being addressed in this present study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susumta. Uh, now, whether there are any questions, uh... I don't see any hand. Yeah. Okay, thanks uh, for a nice presentation. Thank you. Sir. And now the last presentation is uh, with Dr. Professor Pradhan Parsarthi. Please. Okay, there is one question for Susmita by Damodar Pagale. Please. Damodar. Please unmute yourself and ask if you have any question. No, sir. No, I have no question. Okay, fine. Thank you. So now, um, Pradhan, you can start your presentation. Professor Pradhan, share your... First, you unmute yourself. I am audible. Yeah, now you are able. Okay. The slides yeah, is visible? Yeah, visible, yeah. Okay. So, sir, thank you, sir. So my talk is uh, mainly focused on the evaluation of uh, Indian summer monsoon in simulation of CIMI-5 experiment. Uh, as many of us, we know that there is a continuous experiment has been conducted under the CIMI-5 climate model intercompersion project phase 3, 4, 5 and 6. 
so my the whole uh, gist of this talk is based on that there is a if you simulate the semi five experiment and the historical experiment and evaluate the indian summer monsoon rainfall as well as wind circulation year to year variation during the monsoon season it is almost you can catch but when you go on the intra seasonal scale which is very much important for the agriculture purpose and water purposes so it is hardly few models are able to catch the intra seasonal variability of indian summer monsoon rainfall as well as wind and relative humidity because wind circulation and relative humidity is two important factor which is normally responsible for the monsoon roll, uh, monsoon rainfall over the indian continents so the whole talk is focus on this idea so the first slide is focused on the climate model inter comparison phase 3 what i have done i have taken three cases one is simip 3 simip 5 and again in simip 6 in simip 3 we have conducted and carried out the uh, we have analyzed the data of historical experiment for the certain time periods under the simip 3 experiment and we have selected and we have selected these five to five models that model was available output of that model was available during our analysis and we have examined the strength and variability of indian summer monsoon circulation and ismr in selected cm3 model simulations we have used the mean wind at 850 hectopascal 200 hectopascal as well as we use the ismr imd observed ismr for the degree 1 degree and 1 degree as well as we use the ecmw F reanalyzed wind data at the resolution of 1.5 degree to 1.5 degree, and this is the very well known monsoon homogeneous known uh, homogeneous zone provided by the IITM Pune. So what we have done, this is the first figure is the area average mean JJS rainfall millimeter per day during the 1961 to 1990 in IMD observed and model simulations. If you see that we have selected the three regions. Peninsular India, West Central India, and Central North East India. The purpose of selecting this, these three regions is that there is the very less variability of rainfall over these regions. So first, I was interested to see this, how the model is performing where, 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 where uh, over this uh, homogeneous monsoon regions when the rainfall variability is very less. So you see that black one is your, uh, uh, red one is your IMD observed rainfall and how the other model is uh, varying in against the IMD observed rainfall. And the second picture, this is the difference in mean JJS rainfall for the peninsular India, West Central India and Central Northeast India regions. And if you see that, there is the very less variation is found over the Central Northeast India. So over the homogeneous CNI regions, the mean ISMR in June, July, August, we have not considered the September months. In simulation of CCSM3, ECHM5 and GFDL2.1 shows good agreement with the IMD observed rainfall. So this region is in CMIP3 experiment under historical experiment. The three, four, three models are very much close to the IMD observed rainfall especially over the central northeast india now the 850 hectopascal wind and 200 hectopascal wind has been compared model simulated uh, uh, under historical hex experiment wind is compared with the ecmwf reanalyzed data and what we found that the first picture a is for the ecmwf reanalyzed data and other is b c d e and f for the other models so at 850 hectopascal, the position and magnitudes of southward, southwesterly wind in GFDL and these models seems to be close to the reanalyzed values. But they are not exactly following the magnitude and position of the southwesterly wind or Somali jet, what we can say. And this is for the 200 hectopascal wind over the uh, over the Indian Indian subcontinents, if you see the nearby the uh, uh, in a, 
peninsula in india and some parts of the indian ocean the highest magnitudes uh, that is shown in the ecm uh, wf reanalyzed data is 21 meter per second but it is hardly captured by any other models although they are also the position is little bit shifted in other models this sterly jet over this region is not being well captured by the other models especially one or two model is able to capture so at 200 hectopascal the sterly jet of 21 meter per second over indian ocean in ecmwf reanalyze is well simulated by this model ECHM and gfdl model simulations only Again, as you as we know that the vertical wind shear over the box of 5 degree to 15 degree north and 40 to 70 degree east, that is given by B. N. Goswami, that is used for the uh, for the uh, analysis of Indian summer monsoon rainfall. So this is the for the ECMWF and other models. And if you see that over the base for the baseline means under the 1961 to 1990 periods. <coughs> Under the historical experiment, this is comes under the 30.1 and this is hardly captured by any other, other models. Either it is underestimated or overestimated by other models. Only ACHM5 and GFDL is little bit close to these values. So, the estimated vertical shear of zonal mean JJ wind over the Arabian Sea in the ECM seems to be close to the ECMW analyzed data. It seems that ECHM simulations out of the all considered models shows a good agreement with the observed rainfall and realized uh, 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 realized uh, uh, vertical wind shear and uh, this paper has been this paper has been uh, published in global and planetary changes in 2012 at that time there was a very limited models was available for the analysis of the global uh, uh, indian summer monsoon under global warming conditions under historic under historical experiment now after that we use the cm5 model data and we use the 34 almost 34 climate models data to evaluate the indian summer monsoon under historical experiment for the period of 1961 to 2005 and basically we used to evaluate the rainfall and wind circulations and this is the picture of annual cycle of the um, uh, rainfall millimeter per month over the Indian land regions of all models in historical experiment under CM5. There is the broken one is the observed IMD and the observed GPCP is given in the broken line red color. So if you can see that hardly any model is able to capture the peak of the peak of the IMD observed or GPCP rainfall. So annual cycle of simulated rainfall in 34 climate model of historical experiment in observation of IMD and of GPCP, it is difficult to get information about a particular model. However, it may be summarized that how well each model simulated rainfall is comparable with observation of IMD and GPCP. <coughs> Sorry, we could not find any model directly approaching and closing being close to the annual pattern of the uh, uh, monsoon rain uh, uh, annual uh, cycle of the rainfall now again we have tested this uh, model by using the taylor diagram under the historical experiment and compared with the imd and gpcp in these two figures a, a and b uh, this figure i'm sorry this speaker is this pictures and uh, is not very much clear and uh, what we got that cm5 model simulated rainfall of historical experiments is validated with the observed rainfall imd and gpcp and found that models these models bcc ccsm cesm1 csm1 csm1 different version of the csm1 and mpism1 shows closeness with the observations of the imd and gpcp Again, the another way of evaluating this model is the box diagram or this is the whisker plot which is used in the statistical analysis for the statistical analysis. So <coughs> this is all the correction correlation with the CMFIB model simulations in IMD observed and GPCP observed 
and this is the RMSC for CINIF 5. And the variation of correlation and RMSC in observation and historical experiment is shown by box plotting. The spacing between the different parts of the box indicates the degree of dispersion, spread, or skewness and outliers in the model simulated rainfall. And the simulated rainfall approaches to GPCP observation with greater correlation and lower RMSC while it is not well captured in IMD observations. So this is the very important findings that when we are evaluating the global climate model, they are hardly being close to the IMD observed rainfall. They are normally becoming close to the GPCP rainfall. So again, we have evaluated these models for the wind circulation at 850 and 200 hectopascals. And uh, these are for the NSEP wind for the 1961 to 2005. And these are the the models which we have used are selected for the our analysis and similarly this is the mean jjs wind at 200 hectopascal for the period of 1961 to 2005 in historical experiment again this is the 21 meter per second it is hardly represented by any other models in the historical experiment only i found that mpi model is relatively giving better performance than other models in semi 5 experiment Although the data or periods you are taking under consideration is very important when you are doing the climate analysis, model, clim uh, model output climate analysis. But based on this period 1961 to 2005, this is the fact that the model CCSM4 and MPI are able to reproduce JJS wind at 850 hectopascal and 200 hectopascal. Oh, Yes, Try to complete finish, in yeah. very soon. Okay. And this is the intra seasonal variability of Indian summer monsoon rainfall in CIMIP 6 model simulation. This paper appears in the theoretical and applied climatology in 2021. What we have done, we have details of this these two models we have taken, different versions of these models. And we have tried to analyze the relative humidity supplied by the Arabian Sea and as well as with the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal regions. And we found that in July and August, the simulated wind in MPI and MPS shows resemblance to the reanalyzed wind. However, the reanalyzed and simulated relative humidity over the Arabian Sea is relatively less than those over the Bay of Bengal. And the reanalyzed relative humidity over the Arabian Sea is close to the simulation of in BCCSM in JJSM. It seems that the simulated relative humidity shows proximity to the reanalyzed value in June but failed to capture in July, August and September. Over the Bay of Bengal, the variability of reanalyzed relative humidity in mean JJS and individual months is well represented in the simulation of BCCI, BCC CSM2 MR model. And this is the annual cycle for the IMD M1, M2 and M3 model. M1, M2 is represented by this model for the June, July, August, September. And this is for the rainfall distributions. So our findings tells that in semi 3 and semi 5 models are well performed on the intra annual scale when there is the season to season uh, variation in one season in one year and next season uh, in next year but when we come on the intra signal scale or monthly scales the models are almost failed to represent the wind circulation monsoon rainfall summer monsoon rainfall and relative humidity so these are the weakness of the climate models until unless we do not correct the representation of this wind circulation relative humidity on the intra seasonal scale always we can get an error in output of this climate models when we analyzed or evaluate the historical experiment data for the indian summer monsoon regions so this this is my presentation and this is my thought thank you very much thank you thank you professor pradhan uh, whether there is any question? Okay, Dr. P Professor Pradhan has analyzed from CIMIP 3 to CIMIP 5, 6, all, and uh, he has come to some conclusion. So the overall, there were six presentations in this uh, uh, session, and all presentations were uh, very nice, uh, and uh, uh, almost all uh, are published also. 
and uh, they have also shown the climate change and how dynamically it is related and all those things in changes in precipitation and uh, the things. So I think this was a very useful session. Now I am handing over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Sahasab. Uh, yes, it really it was a very good session and the time also you maintained very well. And the, all the speakers, all six talks I was also listening, they are very excellent result. And um, climate change, monsoon variety, extended and prediction. So it is a wonderful session. So thank you very much to you as well as the speakers. Again, thank now you. we will be come back to Hall A for the short oral presentation that will be up at 11.45 local. That means that is uh, 11.45 is 6.15 UTC. So till that time, bye for now. Thank you.
with the connection.
good morning good afternoon good evening wherever wherever you are so welcome to the uh fifth day 26th march this short oral and composted session so this is the last poster session of this uh, workshop uh, so there are uh, total of 16 people present i think 16 yeah total 16 people uh, provided their uh, presentation and some of them not yet submitted their presentation therefore uh, first we'll be completing all those 16 in sequence then afterwards if time permits and uh, if somebody is really interested to present then he or she can present here but only one or two slides so now we'll be starting this session with uh, first Usef. So from the organizer's side, uh, the presentation will go on and one after another, uh, the presentation will be uh, done and you have to maintain the time. You will be allotted with uh, two and a half minutes and then another half minutes or minutes so for a quick question then we'll go ahead with that like that so be precise and complete your whatever the study only covering the objective methodology of your study and a few salient results so that is uh, what you must complete within this uh, presentation so start with uh, will be uh, i think Resma, madam, so our presentation yes, trends and variabilities of Indian summer monsoon rainfall in different intensity winds over west coast and monsoon core zone. So, madam, start. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, the major objective of this paper was to analyze the long term trend. Uh, long-term variability of the summer monsoon rainfall and the rainfall patterns in six intensity bin over the west coast and the monsoon core uh, region in India. And uh, we also investigated the relationship between this region summer monsoon rainfall in different uh, rainfall intensity bin with the global SST. Next slide, please. So for the analysis, we have used the gridded rainfall data from IMD and the sea surface temperature data from Met Office Hardly Center, that the hard ISST data. The period of the analysis was from 1901 to uh, 2020. Uh, and the, uh, the season was JJS, uh, or the summer monsoon rainfall. The region selected were West Coast, the most the coastal strip of the Indian Peninsula region, and the monsoon corn zone. So in this uh, study, we have classified the rain events into six intensity bin based on the percentile value. They are dry, low, moderate, high, very high, and extreme intensity bins as shown in this uh, slide. And we have uh, analyzed uh, the trend and the sig uh, significance of the trend using Senslop estimation and Mankendel test. And uh, we also done a correlation analysis in order to evaluate the strength of relationship between the rainfall and intensity bin in both the regions, they are, how they are correlated, and also uh, to investigate the relationship between the global SST uh, uh, and the rainfall and its intensity bin. And uh, we also done a 31 year sliding correlation analysis to check the consistency of the relationship of global SST with the rainfall and its intensity bins. So uh, in the result, we have seen that uh, the West Coast uh, show an increasing trend in uh, total summer monsoon rainfall over the season and the monsoon course uh, uh, showed a decrease in rainfall with a 90 percentage confidence level 
and in the west coast the extreme intensity been show a significant increasing trend of 6.18 mm per season per decade and in mansoor corn zone the low intensity been show a increasing trend of 1.98 and the very high intensity been show a decreasing trend of 2.62 mm per season per decade this is also at a significant of 90 percentage confidence level then while looking to the strength of relationship between the rainfall in both regions we have seen that all the intensity bins uh, showed a significant coherence or in phase relationship uh, in both the regions uh, for the whole period 1901 to 2020 but for the extreme intensity bin uh, the relations were not coherent and uh, in order to check the time wise variation in this we have done uh, a correlation analysis in four multi decadal period that is the 1901 to 2020 period was subdivided into four multi decadal period with each having 30 year time period and we have seen that the extreme intensity been in both the region was showing a negative correlation uh, over the th uh, first three multi decadal period but in the last uh, or the recent multi decadal period that from 91 uh, 1991 to 2020 The extreme intensity started to show a significant, that is under 95 per confidence level, a significant uh, trend positive uh, correlation. Uh, and uh, towards the uh, recent decade, multi-decade, majority of the uh, intensity wins, that is dry, low, and moderate, also showed significant positive correlations. And the correlation of uh, summer monsoon rainfall and its intensity been with west coast and monsoon core zone with the sst in uh, arabian sea bay of bengal north atlantic ocean nino 3 uh, north central pacific ocean and south west pacific ocean has also uh, to uh, changed towards the recent uh, decades we have seen that the west coast and monsoon core zone um, intensity winds uh, had uh, showed a significant increase in uh, the correlation Uh, correlation uh, in the recent period that is from late 1990s uh, and 2000 and also uh, the extreme intensity been in west coast showed a uh, phase change in the relationship with arabian sea sst so uh, in summary we can say that uh, the recent uh, A significant trend of increasing and decreasing rainfall over west coast and monsoon. Okay, region. madam. Uh, that uh, so we have to uh, conclude actually because others will be also. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, so, okay so, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, if anyone has very a quick question, so please. Uh, so if not so we'll be going to next presentation then please so utkarsh barma uh, so he will be presenting revisiting climatological dynamic circle of precipitation over indian subcontinent using imers data so now utkarsh ji dr barma you are there Are you there to present? So, uh, if not, actually we we can come back again uh, to uh, to his presentation if uh, he he can join. So we can go ahead. Yeah. So now the presentation is by uh, Gopika Benugopal. Uh, okay. So. The presentation is dynamic and thermodynamic structure of atmosphere associated with extreme rainfall events over Kerala during August 2019. So, continue, please. Oh, okay. Sir. So, hi all. Uh, so today I am going to uh, present the uh, dynamic and thermodynamic structure of the atmosphere associated with the extreme rainfall events which took place over Kerala during August 2019. Uh, sir, can you move to the next slide? Uh, so the uh, 2019 southwest monsoon season ended with two major intense spells of very heavy to extremely heavy rainfall events over Kerala region, and the first intense spell was reported during 19 to 23rd of July, and the second spell was reported during 6 to 11th August. 
and the second one in august was one of the uh, most severe and catastrophic rainstorms in the state's history and uh, several studies observed a rainfall of more than 50 mm in 2 hours over many regions of kerala and regarded it as a mesoscale cloudburst event and in our analysis using um, imd gridded rainfall data we have identified that an area located over the uh, central kerala region uh, received maximum amount of rainfall during these days and considering this particular area as our study region we have further analyzed the uh, dynamic and thermodynamic mechanisms of the uh, atmosphere uh, from 6 to 11 august and here in the figure on the left uh, we have analyzed the uh, three hourly march of low level convergence upper level divergence and upper level vorticity using imda data sets along with uh, three hourly march of trmm rainfall and a strong low level convergence and upper level divergence is noticed from 7th onwards which peaks on 8 and a predominant upper tropospheric cyclonic vorticity is noticed from 8th onwards and these mechanism it can be inferred that this mechanism plays a crucial role for the ascending motion observed throughout the troposphere and subsequent precipitation on 8th august over the study region and in the uh, figure on the uh, right side in the top right we have analyzed the Uh, three hourly march of uh, cape and sign during these days and even though it was continuously raining from 6th onwards a sudden increase in cape is noticed from 7th and a very low value of sign is throughout is noticed throughout from 7 to 9th august and it indicates that the near surface stable layer is shallow or its thickness might be very less and the presence of a strong unstable atmosphere during these days and uh, thus uh, it can be the extreme rainfall event which took place over the central districts of kerala um, can be uh, was triggered majorly by the dynamic forcing mechanism uh, which has been further supported by the uh, thermodynamic forcing mechanism so it can be concluded like that uh, thank you thank you madam if anyone has any question madam actually i have one question so uh, you have not actually told about your study uh, domain in sir so, this parameter sir yeah sir i have uh, mentioned it in the poster here it is uh, there is no space for okay it. just okay what is that can you uh, uh, sir it was over the uh, central kerala region between uh, 10 to 11 degree north latitudes okay okay thank you ma'am okay sir so will we go to next yeah i one um, announcement is that these presentations are uh, going here but uh, all those posters can be available in our website of the uh, conference or uh, workshop so the please visit uh, the site and see the poster for uh, more detail they are only 2 uh, 3 minutes uh, they are not able to uh, cover everything so please visit the site and uh, for detail poster okay sir dr bharadwaj please continue uh, thank you sir uh, uh, in this study we are uh, targeting the inter annual scale of variability uh, for uh, seasonal rainfall and uh, see, uh, and the temperature in the india for summer and winter season that will take into account the varying length of the season uh, next slide so uh, we in this study we utilize the imd gridded rainfall analysis data which is available at quarter degree resolution for more than 100 of years and surface temperature data which is available at 1 degree resolution and erssd data which is available at 2 degree of resolution from 1969 to 2005 so in this study the varying length of the season are defined based on noska and mishra 2016 uh, paper in this we uh, computed the onset and demise of the summer and win uh, winter season from daily rainfall and surface temperature res respectively in the figure 1 if you see the uh, this is one of the grid point uh, uh, rainfall amount has been plotted and you can see that the blue dot curves are basically showing the very robust features of rainfall uh, since india major, major rainfall over india happens during jjas season so what features we can draw from this bulge shape so what we have done in defining objective and de uh, uh, demise of the season is based on the uh, climatological rainfall over a grid point uh, there will be a negative contribution if you see the red curve which is a cumulative anomaly curve so if the rainfall amount is less than the climatological rainfall it will contribute negatively and it will go uh, to the minimum location which is 
uh, uh, whenever there is a rainfall amount more than the climatological values. So onset is the mini next day after the minima and demise is when the rainfall uh, goes uh, less than the climatological value. Similar, similar way, the winter season in this case, we cannot define based on the rainfall because uh, uh, rainfall is not the major uh, uh, contribu contributing factor. So uh, we choose the surface temperature to define the winter season. So similar, if we, if we uh, see figure number two, uh, from October to uh, May, th this is the temperature profile. The similar procedure can be adopted when the there is a maximum curve happen when the climatological values of the temperature is uh, 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 less than the actual values. It will give the po positive contribution and similarly maximum and minima. Based on these two, we can define onset and demise for the uh, uh, winter season as well as onset and demise for the summer season. So this procedure can be adopted for all the grid points uh, of uh, India. So if you see figure number three, uh, this figure shows the climatological onset, demise, uh, uh, and length of the season, as well as the seasonal rainfall. The significance of this figure, you can see the local onset. Conclude, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, based on this, we can actually compute the seasonal length uh, 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 based on this objective de definition. Then what we have done is uh, to get the interannual scale of variability. Amit, we... conclude. Yes, sir. So uh, to get the inter uh, scale of variability, uh, we uh, correlate the seasonal length principal component uh, to the uh, ERS SST, and we found that the winter season is uh, negatively correlated with the tropical SST as well as the summer season uh, JJA SST is positively correlated. So we can say that by taking into account of the variable length of the season, we we get stronger correlation compared to the fixed length of the season. So this way can be adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. If anyone has any question, quick question. So if not, we can go ahead with uh, presentation. Uh, Krishna Mishra. So. Um, Krishna, please continue. So, so I am going to present comparative analysis of 2013 uh, and 2021 Southwest monsoon advance over India. In the year 2013, Southwest monsoon covered the entire country within just 16 days from its onset uh, over Kerala on 1st of June to uh, coverage uh, uh, on 16th of June. In 2021, the onset uh, took place over Kerala on 3rd of June until 11th of June. Uh, <coughs> Most parts of the country was uh, covered by the southwest monsoon, except the plains of northwest India. And after that, monsoon uh, uh, progress became slow till 19th of June. And after that, there was a hiatus of three weeks from uh, 19th of June to 11th of July. So we have uh, we have analyzed this uh, all six uh, semi-permanent systems associated with the southwest monsoon by using. Uh, IMD bulletins, IMD monsoon report, and SEP analysis data, and www.worldmonsoon.org uh, Somali Jet Index. So, uh, uh, next slide. Next. Next. So, here we can see that in 2013, Somali Jet Index was more than uh, uh, normal throughout the, throughout the uh, month of june but in the 2021 the, uh, uh, during first half of june somali jet index was above normal but during second half of june somali jet index was uh, below normal next slide and here we can see that the uh, zonal zonal wind 500 spa zonal wind uh, the weekly winds we have taken and we can see that from uh, 18 to 24 june there was a westerly trough which which was mainly responsible for this monsoon hiatus of three weeks and then in the in the following week there was a ridge in 500 spa and uh, again in the following week there was a, in the figure d there was a, a westerly trough and in the the, the next uh, figure e uh, from 9 to 15th of july we can see that a shear zone has developed roughly along 18 degree of latitude uh, uh, indicating active monsoon conditions next slide next and here uh, this is 200 spa anomaly of uh, uh, anomaly uh, GPH anomaly, and we can see that the uh, Tibetan high has shifted north eastwards, indicating indicating weaker monsoon conditions. Next slide. 
and this is the this is the mascarin high shifting south eastwards to its normal position uh, according to gray and sikka this leads to uh, leads to weakening of the somali jet but the heat low over pakistan is close to the normal values so we cannot conclude from heat low any any uh, weaker monsoon conditions next slide and this is the mjo uh, according to pi et al 23 phase phase 23 and 4 are favorable for uh, southwest monsoon active active southwest monsoon conditions and here we can see that mjo lay in phase 1 during june 20th to 30th and it came in phase 3 in second week of july that's all thank you okay thank you uh, if anyone has any question uh, so for details please visit the poster so if not then we will be going to uh, next presentation by arijit datta hello hello good morning everyone so today i'll be talking about the amo monsoon teleconnection focusing on the eurasian is it a bit louder yeah. can you hear me sir yeah yeah now it's fine Yeah, so today I'll be talking about AMO monsoon relationship, focusing on the Eurasian teleconnection. So, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so there is a known uh, relationship between the mid latitudes anomaly and Indian summer monsoon on sub-seasonal and internal time scale. For example, if you see the uh, figure uh, when we talk about the strong and weak uh, West Central Asia years, in the left we uh, look into the upper level anomalies in 200 milliwatt. so when ism impact is included and in the right when we exclude the ism impact we see that there is a feedback from ism on interannual time scale so this relationship is actually getting modulated on multidecadal time scale so in the right we see the 200 milliwatt geopotential height associated with amo and we see that there is an arcing wave pattern that resulting in upper level anomalies over west central asia the black box region and in the time series we do see that all these three climate phenomena including amo the west central asia anomaly and ism are have showing coherent multidecadal changes although in recent decades amo and monsoon there is a difference in the relationship which is uh, possibly related to the pacific influence so we see that there is a ism and wca is actually interacting in uh, interannual time scale and we see that on multidecadal time scale this is again impacting ism in the bottom left figure we see the regression of west central asia index on the 200 milliwatt geopotential height we see that there is a similar signature what we saw in the interannual time scale so what it causes it causes easterly shear over the indian domain which is causing the instability during the monsoon so this is actually revisiting the amo monsoon teleconnection focusing on the mid latitude anomalies so the interannual relationship between the ism and the mid latitude anomalies is modulated getting modulated on multidecadal time scale by amo thank you thank you uh, if anyone had any, any question or if no one has i have one uh, simple question that yes. have you checked that uh, when uh, enso Weak and and so uh, that Illinois is weak and will Illinois is strong. Yes. But this relationship uh, uh, is uh, altering or it is. Yeah. So on same. interannual time scale, there is no, there is not much sensitivity on and so. Actually, there is uh, on paper by Ding and Wang in two thousand five. They talk yeah. about that also. So that in line. Okay. 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 We will be going to next presentation then, please. Lakshmi, she is there. Yes, sir. Yeah. So please present. Uh, so here I am going to present the study on the extended range prediction of Madden Julian oscillation using IATM CFS version two model and the role of initial error on the prediction scale. So uh, there is a widely accepted hypothesis that improving these initial conditions can improve uh, climate models performance in a longer lead time. So the objective of this study is to find whether this hold for uh, the forecast scale of strong MGO events during MJJAS in the IATM CFS version two model, and uh, uh, also the source of large model error cropping up from the uh, initial lead days itself during some few of the initial conditions are also identified in this study. So next slide. 
So uh, the convection and the propagation characteristics of MGO has been captured using OLR, uh, zonal winds at 850 and 200 hectopascal. The data used were NOAA interpolated daily averaged OLR and uh, the NSEP reanalysis data set for the wind uh, variables. And the model data was uh, obtained from CFS version to Hincast of I IATM extended range prediction system. And uh, so the multivariate EOF analysis has been done uh, following the Wheeler and Hendon method 2004. And uh, uh, the EOF was calculated by using a period of data from 1979 to 2018, and the analysis was done for the period from 2003 to 2018. The EOF-1 represent the enhanced convection over the Indian Ocean, and EOF-2 is in quadrature with the EOF-1. And for this analysis, uh, strong MGO events were considered. Uh, from this, two set of events were identified, one with the least error in initial day, that is light cases, and the one with high uh, a set of events with the highest error in the initial days, that is high cases. From the results, we can see that the first figure shows the bivariate RMSE and correlation of light cases and height cases. So from uh, a week to 10 days, after a time of week to 10 days lead, we can see that both the set of cases are having a similar bivariate RMSE uh, um, uh, error. And uh, going to the second figure, uh, it shows the error growth, that is error in a day N minus N minus 1. Uh, so in this also, we can see that the uh, light cases are having a high error growth for the initial few days, that is up to seven to eight days uh, as compared to high cases. But later on, both the set of cases are having a similar error growth pattern also. While seeing the uh, uh, probability density function curve of this error growth as in figure three, uh, the first was the uh, density curve for the initial 10 lead days and the second one shows 10 to 20 lead days. And uh, for the first 10 days, we can see a slight difference in the peaks, but for the second lead days, we can see that they both the light and height cases are uh, showing a similar uh, uh, density distribution in the error growth also. So both the error and error growth of light and height is similar after a lead time of 7 to 10 days. So moving on to the sources of the high error that is cropping up from the initial lead in dead cases. So the figure four shows the PC amplitude error distribution for uh, for the initial day phase and lead days. So in here we can uh, see that those events with initial phase over Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific are having a high error uh, in the PC amplitude. So next slide please. And uh, uh, this shows the spatial distribution of uh, uh, the first one shows the spatial distribution of upper level winds and the second one shows, uh, sorry, first one shows the lower level wind and second one shows the high, uh, high level winds. The first uh, row in the first, uh, uh, this um, figure shows the uh, light cases and the second row shows the height cases, similar for the second figure also. In the first figure itself, if you can see the th third uh, uh, set of, um, th this is arranged in the order of observation. Just gist of what is those figures are telling. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Sir. So uh, in the uh, while seeing the bias, that is the third set of figures in e third set of figures in each of these figures, we can see that for the light cases, uh, uh, the error is getting uh, cropping up after a. Uh, uh, 10 days over the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific region. But for height cases, the initial from the initial set of like initial lead days itself, uh, there is a high error that is uh, being developed in the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific region. And the similar um, um, error has also been observed in the upper level winds also. So summarizing, we can say that the effect of initial error in the forecast of uh, lead time greater than 10 days is much limited while predicting the MGO using IATM CFS version 2 model. And the difference in error growth in height and light cases is related to constraints in model physics. So incorrect model forecast over Western Pacific and Indian Ocean region is reducing the model prediction scale. And the initial improvement of error in PC is not being carried beyond a lead time of 10 days in this model. So more emphasis is to be given to sorting out the biases in model dynamics and physics uh, rather than focusing on improving the initial conditions for the extended range prediction of MGO using this model. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Anyone has any question? So this is Ashok Raja on uh, just uh, uh, take away. Is there any particular bias or solution in your mind to uh, take over this? problem 
because you have told almost everything is uh, bad. So, is there any particular bias which needs to be added into the model dynamics? No, no, no. Actually, the, the objective of this study is not that. Actually, here map is telling that Lakshmi is focusing that. Uh, the IC rather uh, IC dependent, it is that errors are not very much in IC dependent, rather it is based on uh, problem with mm -hmm. the model. So, either it may be dynamics or physics. Okay. So, uh, it is the error where we should focus. Uh, that is what it is telling, the study is telling. Yes, sir. Okay, so we are going to next uh, okay, sir. presentation. So, Sai Krishna, Dr. Sai Krishna is there. I couldn't find uh, the other in the participant list. Uh, what is there? To so present this paper, anyone is there? Okay, so we are going to next by Mahesh Kalsetti. Kalsetti. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, presenting the scale of subseasonal to seasonal forecast model in predicting the eddy forcing associated with the extropical tropical interaction. As we know that mean flow modulation due to a transient eddy is an integral part of the atmospheric general circulation over the tropics as well as the extratropics. To analyze the significant impact of the transient eddy uh, on the, uh, uh, like uh, uh, transient uh, uh, heat flux and transient momentum flux, uh, we use diagnostic tools to uh, get the impact of the transient eddy as well as the, uh, based on the transient eddy transport indices. The objective of the study will be to identify and address the uh, uh, critical factor responsible for the EDUT interaction and the uh, real time rainfall forecast and various aspects of the monsoon intraseasonal variability with the help of the dynamical modeling. Next slide, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, in present study, we have used the uh, ARFI reanalysis data as well as the rainfall from the TRMM and uh, we tested the forecast scale based on the IITM Airbus handcast. So, uh, in present, uh, first uh, figure shows the uh, lead lag relationship between the transient meridional transient area transport indices with the rainfall. Here we have uh, have the line composite of the standardized rainfall anomaly uh, for the all the instances over the active and break days. First panel in first figure. Uh, uh, with respect to the EMF indices, but there are only uh, around 22% of active and break spells are uh, sh shows the lag relationship with, with uh, day uh, zero rainfall or active and break days. The, uh, the, here we use the indices EMF transport. We uh, we suggest that if a positive EMF uh, transport means the uh, pole word transport of the eddy momentum flux and negative means uh, uh, equator word transport of the indices. Uh, after identifying the indices, we have uh, tested the rainfall composite uh, uh, second figure. Uh, second row here we we found that the enhanced uh, rainfall activities over the Gujarat region uh, and uh, over the West Bengal and sub subdued rainfall over the uh, Western Ghats as well as the Central India. For the break, we have, we have seen uh, the, uh, enhanced rainfall activity over the North East, uh, North East region as well as over South Central India. Uh, next, we have looked the two sigma rainfall analysis under the consideration of the only EMF indices. Here, uh, figure three, we can see there is a uh, northward pro propagation of the rain bands of uh, plus minus uh, three days. Uh, with the there is a eastward propagating the gyres, and at the uh, day three, the, there is an enhanced circulation, which is we call east station uh, east station uh, anti anticyclone. Uh, then uh, we tested this uh, uh, 
um, uh, day zero rainfall based on the e vector approach and the uh, right right column so the divergence pattern moving eastward uh, as a day progress on day zero there is a strong e vector divergence uh, james etol 1994 suggests that if uh, there is a uh, meridional gradient of the divergence of e vector is proportional to the transitive vorticity flux divergence so uh, it uh, uh, induces the anticyclonic vorticity forcing that uh, day zero it uh, rainfall enhances next we have tested the skill uh, of the uh, handcast for the rainfall uh, for the various uh, uh, no trans uh, transient effect and uh, uh, present of the transient eddies here no transient are class, uh, known as a neutral condition uh, and or rest of the four for emf uh, poleward uh, equator transport and ehf transport uh, poleward equator word over monsoon core reason we can see th that uh, the rainfall predict predictability for the e equator transport of the emf is persist uh, up to the four week uh, followed by the neutral condition over the northwest region as we know that it is uh, under the influence of the uh, wd type of response all the year so uh, okay, only up to the second scale there is a persist in the um, uh, yes. so in summary uh, uh, for the first time e vector diagnostic tool used for the defining the atp monsoonal interaction also active in break spells rainfall patterns associated with the extratropical forcings are presented for the first time observation depicts emf index could act as a 13 days lead precursor for the predicting the tropical phenomena such as the onset of active break spells extratropical originated transient can influence anomalous extreme rainfall and uh, rare two sigma rain, north indian rainfall composites suggest upper tropospheric eastward migrating forcing induces southward upper level anticyclonic forcing which further appeals the existing monsoon surge the skill of sts forecast over the monsoon core zone is not always robust when there is a no extratropical transit hence the sts skill would be improved if the extratropical transit eddies are better simulated for the further discussion please okay. visit my post section thank you sir okay uh, you have covered little more time uh, any or still if anyone has any question yes Mahesh, uh, I have one question. Uh, what is the uh, period of this transient? Uh, period. Uh, for uh, in present analysis, we use thirty to sixty days uh, transient days. Okay. You can use wavelet actually. Try it. Try it. Huh? Sorry, sir. Wavelet transform. and not during those uh, period uh, you can use the wavelet transform yes sir the indices itself is a uh, form with the help of the wavelet transform okay thank you sir your poster okay uh, next presentation by pratibha gautam yes sir sir i am audible yeah yeah see sure. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Pratibha Watham from IITM Pune. Today I'll be presenting the role of land surface feedback process and prediction skill in S2S scale during the monsoon onset and uh, in the coupled model framework. So the main objective of this analysis is first we will see how the uh, different land surface initialization of, uh, affect the monsoon onset uh, in the S2S scale, and second we will see how it affect the prediction skill uh, um, by the land surface parameter. Next slide, please. So for that analysis, we have taken uh, two experiments from the UKMO model. Uh, in one, uh, they have initialized the soil moisture from the climatology, and soil temperature and snow were initialized from the air and trim reanalysis, which is referred as UKMO old. And in the second experiment, they have used a uh, land surface reanalysis, uh, which is uh, which was created by Jules land surface model, uh, forced by JRA 55 reanalysis, which is referred as UKMO new. So for comparison, um, of the model output we have uh, uh, we have taken amd observation for rainfall and for other variable we have we have taken uh, era 5 pre analysis data set and we have taken monsoon onset dates from this paper joseph et al 2015 uh, for more detail you can visit my poster in data and methodology part so 
Uh, so in result, uh, first we have seen that how this two different uh, land surface initialization affect the monsoon onset. Uh, so here I have plotted the biases in the rainfall. Uh, this first, uh, this first A represent the biases in the uh, rainfall pattern in the UKMO new model, and this is one B represent the UKMO old, and this is uh, third represent the biases between the two UKMO new mass old. Further, we have compared this with ITM uh, CFS model. This is uh, the one D represent the and biases in NCMRWF and the second is uh, biases in NCIP and this is the NCMRWF minus NCIP. So we can see that from the uh, rainfall bias, we can see that the both the model, uh, if we consider UKMO new model, so we can see that in both the model, UKMO new and UKMO old, both are not able to capture the rainfall pattern over the, uh, um, um, over the, uh, this, uh, over the, uh, uh, rainfall over that um, ROK region. So further, uh, we have seen that how this uh, biases in the rainfall is uh, related to the uh, biases in the uh, uh, land surface parameter. So for that here uh, in figure two, we have plotted the kinetic energy of rotational component of 10 meter wind and the, and the rainfall pattern. So this is uh, this one is from the, the biases in the UKMO uh, new and this is UKMO old uh, for the rotational component of uh, 10 meter wind and this is uh, the one uh, the 2c represent the uh, biases in ukmo old and ukmo new so this is from this uh this is from the uh, this is for uh, rotational biases in the rotational component and this uh, second plot represents the biases in the divergence component so from this uh, biases uh, plot, we can see that the, both the model is uh, not able to capture the near surface uh, variable. Uh, we can see that there is a huge bias in capturing. Uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, this is, there is a positive bias over the land and this is the negative bias. Please so uh, try can, to conclude. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so we can see that the, both the biases in the land and ocean are different. So it, we can see that the feedback is different. Further, we have analyzed the its prediction scale uh, in the UKMO model. So in summary, we can see that the UKMO new possesses the better prediction skill beyond the 10 days leap. And uh, we can say that uh, if we have error in the near surface variable, like in soil moisture and temperature, it would affect the near surface uh, fluxes, like uh, 10 meter wind uh, relative humidity. Further, it will affect the monsoon onset rate over that region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so anyone has any question? Okay, if not, then we will go to next presentation by Devabrat Sarma. Devabrat Sarma, I can see actually uh, in the participant list. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please continue. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Devabrat Sharma. Uh, I am from the Institute of Advanced Study in Science and Technology, Guwahati, Assam. Uh, I am working in the field of long lead prediction and predictability of the Indian summer monsoon rainfall. So, uh, the objective of the work that I will be presenting today is based on a uh, method that is used for the true estimation of the long lead potential predictability of ISMR by taking into account uh, the simultaneous contribution from all the three tropical ocean basins, um, that is the Atlantic, Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. Uh, so the motivation behind uh, this work is that we believe that in order to uh, estimate the uh, real potential predictability, uh, we need to build a predictor which will take into account uh, the contribution from all the three ocean as well as both the tropics and extratropical uh, predictors. Uh, so the data that we have uh, used uh, in uh, for this work uh, is uh, um, the ISM data we have taken uh, from the IITM uh, data archive. We have taken the sea surface temperature data from the uh, COBE SST uh, to reanalysis, and we have also used heat containing D20 variables, which we have taken from the simple ocean data uh, analysis version 2.2.4. And we have kept the special field to be between uh, 0 to 360 longitude and uh, 30 south 30 north latitude, so that we can uh, incorporate both the tropical as well as extratropical uh, um, predictors or the drivers of the Indian summer monsoon rainfall. So the methodology is as follows. So what we do is that suppose we are uh, building the predictors for the D20, and um, we are building the predictor at a lag one. So we have built uh, build predictors uh, uh, from lag one to lag 48. So lag one may uh, represents May. Uh, so 
suppose we are uh, building predictions for uh, lag one and we will take the may d20 maps uh, for that particular uh, for over a period of 136 years say and we will project it on the correlation map with the ismr and we will generate the uh, DP predictors. So similarly, we have generated the C sub, uh, SSE predictors, which we call as SP and uh, Hirkan predictor, which we call as HP. And uh, we found that uh, the correlation with the D, uh, D20 predictor and Hirkan predictor uh, of uh, um, ISMR uh, with ISMR is uh, high, not at short lead, but also at long lead. Uh, that, are, that is around 18 to 24 months lead. But the correlation with the uh, SST predictor with the ISMR is uh, very weak. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, understand these intriguing results uh, uh, related to the D20 predictor, we also did a error growth reanalysis, so error growth analysis, uh, so which is basically uh, based on the event to event variability that we have uh, uh, of the warm and the cool events uh, that is taken uh, from the uh, global recharge recharge oscillator associated with the D20, and uh, uh, so we uh, so the black curve basically represents uh, the uh, the uh, the growth of errors or the error propagation uh, with lead month of the warm events, and uh, the, the the red one basically represents the uh, growth of, of error or error propagation of the uh, cold events, and the. And uh, you can uh, just know that uh, uh, the ISMR is uh, phase locked with the annual cycle. And from the error growth analysis, we can see that the fluctuation of the error are also uh, phase locked with the annual cycle. And um, uh, from both the peak and vessel, as well as from the trough, uh, we can see that at 18 to around 24 months, the error growth is uh, minimum. So these uh, the, the initial errors at 18 to 24 months uh, represent the initial conditions uh, at which we have achieved uh, such a high. Uh, uh, potential predictability of ISMR, which is around uh, 0.8 at uh, number three. Now summarize, please. Yes, sir. So in summary, uh, we will conclude that uh, uh, that uh, we need to take the contribution from all the three um, tropical basins. Uh, so the, we have represented also a graph here uh, where we have taken the Pacific uh, basin only, and when we take the global basin, it makes a huge difference. Uh, so. Uh, the D20-based predictor, which is associated with the global recharge oscillator, is most suitable for the estimation of this potential predictability of ISMR. And uh, since both ISMR as, the, as well as the initial error of D20 are phase locked with the annual cycle, uh, we are able to achieve this uh, high uh, long lead potential predictability at around 18 to 24 months. Thank you. Thank you. So, any question? Okay, if not, so we'll be go to, going to next presentation. Darshana Patekar. So, Darshana, ma'am. Uh, we couldn't find in the participant list then. No, yes, she is there actually, I can see. Darshana Patekar uh, in the particip 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 uh, participant list, uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah, uh, are you presenting or uh, we'll go ahead with the next presentation? Darshana, madam. You can write in the chat box if you have any technical issue, please write in the chat box. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Should we start? Okay. Please okay. start. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Darshana Partika. Uh, I'm working as a research fellow in Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, India. The topic of my presentation is Subseasonal Variability of the Indian Summer Monsoon Rainfall 2020 in Observation and CFS to Hindcast. The objective is to investigate the possible reasons determining the unusually reduced rainfall in July 2020 in observation and couple model. Next slide, please. Uh, the study period is 1979 to 2020. Data taken from SST data is from ERSST, other variables from NCEP NCAR and GPC rainfall has been used. For this study, the coupled model uh, is used as NCEP or climate forecast system version. 2 with 91 hindcast prepared for uh, 1985 to 2020 which is initialized in may and february so the 2019 was a weak and new year that vanishes quickly in spring season and transmit to lanina in 2020. year 2020 is the third highest in all india seasonal rainfall since 1990. high positive rainfall anomalies related to lanina noticed almost all over india from june to september except in july uh, particularly 
2020 in July 2020 strong negative rainfall anomalies over monsoon crop region from Bay of Bengal to northwest India is noticed. This is mainly because of westward extended anomalous western north Pacific and cyclonic circulation that is the Pacific Japan pattern in July. So there is interbasin interaction between this PJ mode and the anomalous tropical Indian Ocean warming which is called as the Indo-Western Pacific Ocean Capacitor mode. So here it is important to investigate the role of PJ mode in July 2020. Here the PJ mode is extracted by uh, applying the EOF analysis over the 850 HP of vorticity anomaly in July over the uh, Indo-Western Pacific region and the corresponding PC is correlated with rainfall and SST and uh, wind uh, at 850 HP. So we can clearly see the lower rainfall over the monsoon tough region associated to PJ mode. Also the West North Pacific anticyclonic circulation extended to Indian uh, region, especially over the monsoon top region. So here we can say that the uh, it, uh, we can say that the changes in the West North Pacific anticyclonic circulation associated to PJ pattern are mainly causing the low rainfall in July over the monsoon top region in the presence of Lamina. Uh, the same we can uh, see in uh, SLP signals over the West North Pacific region, which are positive SLP, which are extended over, extended uh, over the monsoon top region. Also the uh, or level diversions over the Western Indian Ocean uh, can be seen. Uh, here, if we in 200 HP event, if we see the uh, subtropical jet position as compared to June and August, the subtropical jet position is slightly southward, which may have uh, which may weaken the uh, Tibetan high and which further influence the tropical easterly jet and hence have impact on monsoon. So, uh, if we see the uh, model, if we see the model hankers. That unlike observation, models showing low rainfall in June and high rainfall in July, this is mainly because of the overestimated Lanyan signal in both May and uh, February initial conditions. Also, uh, the overestimated, hence the overestimated positive uh, rainfall anomalies are observed over the Indian region in July. Uh, the main, uh, also the anomalous low level WNP anticyclone is missing in both the hankers in July. So, uh, concluding this session, we can uh, say that the less than normal rainfall over the monsoon trough region in observation in July 2020, it is mainly due to the anomalous westward extension of uh, WMP anticyclone associated to strong Pacific Japan mode, uh, the southward displacement of subtropical jet, and less number of depressions developed in the Indian Ocean during July. Uh, the CFSP2 model shows low scale in the reproducing month to month rainfall variation in summer and uh, instead both the uh, hankers show uh, the uh, low rain, uh, high rainfall in July in contrast to observation. So the main reasons for anomalously high rainfall uh, uh, in model is that the highly overestimated lamina in models throughout the summer, uh, summer monsoon season, overestimated lamina controls the upper level and low level uh, circulation anomalies and also absence of West North Pacific anticyclonic circulations in July 2020. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Uh, okay, uh, we, we can have a quick question. Okay, so go to next, uh, please. Yeah, Asok Raja. Yes, sir, I'm available. Okay, so start, please. Hi, I'm Ashok. I'm working as a scientist in uh, hydro division at IMD. So today I'm going to present on the topic of performance of flash garden system or west coast of India during the tropical cyclone Tauta. So the prime motivation of the study is to see um, how R2 process, um, like research to operation process, and how to uh, see impact based forecast based upon the um, thing which was available in our operational platform. So the objective is very uh, clear to provide location specific flashback guidance alerts, which is in the form of 24 hour risk and three hour threat products. Uh, we used two regional models um, uh, and one uh, uh, IMD GFS global model. Apart from this, uh, we do also in integrated real time gauge observation that is 5,500 plus observations and satellite data and 17 Doppler beta data of India. So the study was to see how the performance of this particular system, which was operational in 2021, uh, how the performance uh, 
gave, which reflect to the impacts uh, in the local level, in the watershed level. So we took the study period between 14th to 19th May. So uh, slide two, please. Yes. So I will not go into the data, what all we used. You can see from the poster actually. So it has uh, uh, 33 diagnostic products and 18 for prognostic products. Also, all these are available with us every six hours. And the data goes inside in real time mode in the hydrologic model here used is SAC SMA. Uh, so there are total uh, 1 lakh watersheds as of now, and it is fully operated on a GIS dynamic platform for the operational forecasters. So here in this case, uh, what happened is the cyclone track was uh, given uh, prior to 14th May, and uh, it was continuously tracked by the RSMC bulletins. And we followed when it was in a low pressure system itself. And we also have a hazard map, which is also prepared by IMD. So hazard map is a uh, district wise hazard map uh, based upon the climatological data. And we do have a hourly real time satellite data, which has been a hydro estimator data based upon infrared microwave adjusted. So uh, while following the track of the cyclone, we found out many storm surge activities and many coastal flood occurrences. But in this case, we are going to concentrate only upon what has exactly happened in two particular districts. One is in Tathnagari and another one is Sindhudurg. So what here was the hint in the operational platform. So all the things which were discussed here uh, occurred in a span of uh, less than eight hours in the operational platform. So before the start of the intense spill, that is on May 16th, you can clearly see the soil saturation was completely minimum and the FFG values were actually high. And when the handfall occurred, that was a rapid handfall. And I will show you how much was the handfall amount. It started from six millimeter and it went up to 36 centimeters, rubbing over all the watersheds of these two particular districts. And at 1200 UTC, you can clearly see there is a bunch of soil. It's saturated which is an immense rise, the top 20 centimeter soil and the subsurface is also get saturated, beyond which it goes for the surface runoff. So the plastic threat and the plastic risk was also indicated and uh, communicated. Yeah, please please slide number two, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so the results here is uh, we take care of the land surface parameters, atmospheric parameters, and we gave around 16th number of operational alerts um, uh, for the complete cyclone period. We had many successful studies and these two are the most particular study which has occurred and which has helped the uh, uh, state people and the managers to take away. So the conclusion of the study is um, how the utility of the GIS platform along with the forecast products in reference to the now cost from the Doppler with the radar is being properly used in the operational platform by the hydrologist and hydrologist. And uh, to be having a further suggestion, if we include the real time socio economic data, it might be much more effective for taking decision making process at the critical times. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. So will be uh, this uh, product. Uh, so. If uh, you can visit uh, poster for details. So we are going to next presentation, please. Yeah, Dr. Reggie. Dr. Reggie. So this percent or not? I think not. Uh, uh, we are not. Finding him or her here in the list. Okay. So anybody will be presenting in the from this uh, participant list? Yes, sir. Uh, my, I am Amuri Ute from IIT Pune. My name is okay. there in the list, but uh, my PPT has not came there. My name is not announced. Uh, no, I I will be coming to the uh, just whoever could not present, I'll be coming to them at the last. Uh, so whatever is uh, there in the uh, present 
if anybody is presenting this paper. So if not, so we'll be going to next. So, Madam Archana. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, yeah, yeah. Please present. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself is Archana. I am from MIT University, research scholar. Uh, today's my presentation topic is characteristic features of low level jet uh, in era 5 and IMDA during Indian summer monsoon in satellite era. It is the first time uh, we are checking this low level jet feature in IMDA. Uh, previous mostly uh, papers uh, use uh, NSEP, era 5 and all these data but IMDA is the first our uh, data set which is very high resolution so we uh, took this data so objective of this paper is to know the climatological features of low level jet during indian summer monsoon rainfall season that is june to september using two different high resolution reanalysis data sets so please next slide So uh, in these data sets, uh, this ERA 5 is 0.25 resolution and IMDA is 0.12 resolution. And we use uh, variables like uh, U wind, V wind, uh, R for uh, re relative humidity, Q is for specific humidity, and T is for temperature and MSLP. In IMDA, uh, specific humidity is not present. We calculated using the formula. And for rainfall, we use IMD data set, which is on 0.25 resolution. Uh, for this analysis, we use student t-test which is applied to identify where this uh, two data set have there is significant difference or not. So first we check and we find out the statistically significant spatial variation is noted in both the uh, reanalysis data set. Whereas ERA 5 and IMDA both suggested better rainfall patterns over Himalayan foothills during the monsoon season. Uh, and also uh, era 5 and imda reanalysis capture the llj features but the amplitude of uh, wind in imda reanalysis data set is lower than the era 5 reanalysis set uh, and we check a uh, different level like 925 850 and 700 hectopascal so in that we find out at 925 hectopascal in era 5 reanalysis data both data sets show substantial increasing trend uh, in wind strength at all study, matlab, uh, all uh, pressure level, different pressure level. So the LLJ core zone is located between uh, uh, 10 degree to 15 degree north and 15 to 60 degree east and it is extended vertically up to 700 hectopascal with maximum core winds linearing at 900 to 850 hectopascal uh, and over the Indian region era 5 performs slightly better than the IMDA reanalysis for the figures and all more details please visit my poster thank you so much thank you so uh, no results figure is available so we have to visit uh, certainly uh, the poster uh, so uh, any question is there? If not, we will go into next presentation. Yeah, Yagya Seni Das. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, audible. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Yagya Seni Das, research scholar at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Uh, I am here to present the role of machine learning for Indian monsoon prediction. Uh, accurate prediction of Indian monsoon is necessary for agriculture, power and water resources. The objective of this paper is to gain insight into various machine learning techniques and to provide an overview of the applicability of machine learning techniques for Indian monsoon rainfall prediction. Next slide, next slide please. The key motivation to construct a machine learning model is the availability of huge climate data. There are several climate data sets are available comprising of uh, time series data, predictor data, 
climate model data, etc. Based upon the requirement, researcher can use the data sets of their choice of study. After collecting the data, then uh, the next step is data pre-processing, which is an important step before applying any machine learning model. Pre-processing of data is necessary uh, to transfer the raw climate data into useful format. For example, data normalization. Then the data is divided into training and testing phases. The machine learning is categorized into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and deep learning. Based upon the requirement, researcher can use the suitable machine learning model. The machine learning based predictive models are built in by following the mechanism uh, of the figure as shown uh, here. Uh, first, the past rainfall data is used for training, then data pre-processing, techniques uh, are applied. Then the suitable machine learning model is used to build a predictive model based on the training data. The same predictive model is used for predicting the new monsoon rainfall testing data. Machine learning techniques are gaining popularity due to their wider applicability and incredible efficacy to solve a complex problem in an effective way, but their lack of wider application from a climate prediction perspective is in need of concern. The previous studies as shown in the following table indicate their potential applicability in uh, Indian monsoon rainfall prediction. These are some of the relevant studies uh, experimented uh, in our laboratory. Uh, the first, uh, initially, uh, we have uh, carried out the study in 2017 by using the IRDM time series uh, data for Northeast monsoon rainfall. We have used sea surface temperature and sea level pressure as predictors, and you have used the techniques artificial neural network and extreme learning machine. And we found out that the better technique is extreme learning machine with RADVAS activation function, and uh, sea surface temperature is a good predictor than sea level pressure. Similarly, we have done uh, several uh, studies in 2017, 2018, and 2019. All these studies uh, uh, are presented in my poster. Please visit my poster. And uh, these are uh, in 2019, we have used the uh, IATM time series data for Indian summer monsoon rainfall, where we have used the predictor sea level uh, temperature and sea level pressure. And we have used single layer feed forward neural network, extreme learning machine, regularized online uh, sequential random vector functional neural network were, and we found out that the better predictor is the combination of sea surface temperature and sea level pressure and the better technique is uh, ROS or vapor technique. So um, now coming to the summary, uh, machine learning models are used for forecasting climate phenomena, extreme weather events, downscaling of climate variables, data assimilation, detecting climate regions, story of climate predictors, and their association with Indian monsoon, etc. Still, exploration of potential machine learning techniques for climate science is in preliminary stage for which there is a dire need for extensive research. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, but uh, uh, you have to look into the extremes actually, whether the performance is good for predicting the extremes. Okay, uh, thank you, madam. So now uh, we can uh, uh, go to the presenter who has presented in this sequence. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bibhute and uh, Sivin Balakrishnan, two actually reported that they will present. So you can directly present from your terminal or device. Okay, All sir. Right. I am Amal Bibhute. I will can I present. Okay, me? so Amal, you present then. Yeah. Okay, sir. I am sharing my screen. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is my screen is visible, sir? Uh, yeah, screen is visible. Make it full, Chris, uh, full screen. Yes, sir. I am Amul at working at IITM Pune. Uh, my objective is to study the impact of meridional displacement of Asian jet on the Indian summer monsoon rainfall in observations and climate system version, climate system forecast model. Uh, I will go to the uh, next slide that is data sets used and methodology. Uh, in the in this section. Uh, and in this study, we have used the atmospheric data from the ECMWF and ERA-5U 
as well as the SST data from ERSST and GPC period fault data. The CFSV2 retrospective forecasts are prepared for nine months and covering a period of 35 years uh, from 1985 to 2019 at IITM. The EOF analysis, correlation, and regression analysis 20 test will be used for this study. I will go to the results. The first figure shows the climatology of zonal wind at 200 hectopascal uh, in the summer months, uh, which shows the uh, which shows the strong SNG that is centered at around 40 degree north in uh, in the observation in figure A and in the same uh, uh, same is is indicated in figure B for the model. So this uh, the box uh, indicated here is used to uh, calculate the EOF analysis of 200 uh, hectopascal zonal wind. And uh, this indicates the merodial displacement of the SNJ. The PC associated with it gives the merodial displacement index and regression of this merodial displacement index uh, with the zonal wind at uh, 200 hectopascal and the total winds indicated in figure C in the for the observation. And same is indicated for the uh, model in the figure D. So this indicates the uh, merodial uh, SNJ is displaced southward with strong positive anomalies to the south of the 40 degree north and strong negative anomalies with the north of the 40 degree north. So the uh, this mirror and this sort of shift of the Asian jet is uh, highly located over the uh, East Asia than the West Asia and associated and uh, associated cyclic circulation is also strongly uh, strongly strong in the East Asia than the West Asia. But in the model, this mirror and displacement is strong in both in the West Asia as well as the East Asia associated and associated and cyclone circulation is also uh, well also uh, strong in the West and East Asia. So associated with this strong southward displacement, the rainfall is decreased over the uh, central central India, and this rainfall decreased is due to the uh, weakening of the tropical easterly jet, and this in decreases the uh, rainfall over India. So, uh, associated with this, uh, associated with southward displacement of the Asian jet, the rainfall is also uh, decreased over the uh, India in the model. Uh, but this uh, further we have looked into that the El Nino is influencing more into this. Uh, El Nino associated with the uh, southward shift is influencing more to this decreased rainfall. Uh, so, and as well as the uh, rainfall over the Indian landmass is uh, more specially extended associated with the jet. So for this reason, we have looked into the month-to-month Asian jet variability, where we have seen that uh, the Asian jet is shift from West Asia to the East Asia for in from June to September. But this it shift concluded. But but this shift is uh, prominent in the June and July in the model, but. Uh, in the September, this uh, uh, this equator was shift is strong in the both West and East Asia. So it is uh, so this uh, West Asian uh, um, West Asian uh, this southward shift in the West Asia is uh, contributing more into the uh, in the September is contributing more to the seasonal rainfall as well as the uh, in the Asian my uh, southward displacement of the Asian jet. So my conclusion is to. My conclusion is the mineral space of the jet on the seasonal mean is stronger over the East Asian region in the observation, but which is not well represented in the model. Month to month variations of southern displacement of the Asian jet are well captured by the model in June and July, but failed to capture in the other months. The, so this uh, this seasonal rainfall is uh, 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 highly highly influenced by the El Nino in the model. So I will I would like to thank you for this uh, for the for the giving opportunity uh, to present work here. Thank you. So, uh, Sivin, uh, please uh, make your presentation ready. Yes, sir. Uh, is my presentation visible, sir? Uh, not yet. Share the screen, not the application, please. I have shared the screen, sir. Uh, it is not coming. Shivin, share the complete screen. 
not the slide alone. Okay, Busair, uh, actually, uh, Sai Krishna is writing that he wants to present, his presentation is there in your list. Can you make uh, that? Okay, sir, can I, now or after Sibin? Sibin is not able to share actually, so we can uh, in between finish uh, Sai Krishna. Okay, then Sibin can send the email to me, then I can present from my side. Yeah, yeah. In between, See, we are having e poster of Shibin. We don't have the e uh, PPT of Shibin. Yeah, yeah so the... Shibin, please, if you have the PPT, send it immediately to Busair uh, so that uh, it will be presented from this side if you have any technical issue. Okay. Sir, one thirty six actually. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, so Sai, Sai Krishna, you uh, pre continue to present. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am ready. Thank you. <clears throat> everybody Hello, loud, please. Hello, everyone. This is Sai Krishna from Manity Raurkala. Today, I am going to present yeah. my topic on impact of spectral nudging in the simulation of summer monsoon rainfall over India. Uh, generally, uh, summer monsoon, uh, southwest monsoon receives about 80% of rain, annual rainfall over India. So, skillful prediction is very essential for the uh, crop yielding and uh, <clears throat> social economic impact on the uh, social economic status of India. For, for this purpose, from last few decades, we are using global general circulation models. Even the these global mo global circulation models are uh, up to the mark in simulating the large scale features. And these are these large scale features, but the the rainfall simulation is uh, skill is uh, comparatively poor. So we uh, it, it, it's mainly because of the coarser resolution of the global circulation models. So, in the next further, the downscale approach came to the existence to downscaling the global circulation for global model forecast to uh, forecast in the regional uh, regional climate models, so that the uh, we can uh, we can improve the prediction rainfall, uh, so that we are improving the rainfall simulation, and similarly. For long term, long long time scale simulations in the even in the high, even in the downscaling approach, we are we are facing some inconsistency between the uh, large scale features and driving fields. It's main it's 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 leads to the climate drift. So that to reduce this, there is a, there is a method called spectral nudging is introduced in simulating the in simulating the rain uh, ISMR rainfall. In the main object to coming to the main coming to the object to the main object of the study is to evaluate the impact of spectral nudging in the simulation of IMS, ISMR variability at seasonal, subseasonal, uh, subseasonal over India and its homogeneous regions. It also assess the model fidelity of the fidelity in capturing the monsoon extremes such as normal uh, excess uh, and deficit years. So next slide, please. Uh, for this to, uh, to achieve this object, we have conducted two experiments by using the ECMWRF data at 75 kilometer as the initial and boundary conditions. And the both in both experiments, we have been updated the SST and commonly we have maintained the we kept constant the parameterization schemes. And we have considered the domain like uh, 10 degrees south to 45 north and 45 east to 110 east 110 east and for validating the for validation to validate the simulated rainfall in on the both experiments we have used imd data coming to the result we simulate the in the result part the, the simulation of seasonal rainfall is well captured in the the spatial pattern and magnitudes are well captured in the spe, spectral nudging compared to the an, nsn experiment in if you see the mean rainfall we have conducted about 37 monsoon years from 1980 to 2018. Um, the mean mean rainfall of 
all india rainfall is about 6.9 in the imd whereas in the uh, whereas in the spectral nudging it's about 6.7 it is very close to the imd uh, observation so we can say we also uh, extended our uh, our analysis to the region wise like homogeneous regions peninsula north east please okay next coming to the subseasonal scale we observed very interestingly we observed the a uh, huge variation in the june to july uh, july july simulation rainfall and the similarly we can, we, we observed the rms among all the overall all the regions uh, the rms is very comparatively less compared compared to the non experiment non uh, non spectral nudging method in the interland interannual variability of ismr we divided the ex, normal excess and deficient years and we uh, we observed the sim, uh, frequency of the rainfall and among all these also among all these summarize coming to the conclusion in the spectral nudging seasonal and sub seasonal scales are improved and the rainfall bias is also rainfall bias and magnitude is less compared less biases are observed and among about five homogeneous regions of six five homogeneous regions are well captured compared among the six homogeneous significant improvement is observed in the uh, First 60 days spectral nudging. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sakis. Now, one thing I should say it is either ECMWF or NCMRWF. Uh, it's not ECMRWF. Okay. <laughs> okay, so next. Oh, ECMWF. Uh, ECMWF. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, so, any of the uh, answer? Uh, so, Sivin will be presenting. Yeah. Oh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, can you make it full screen? Uh, Busher, go to view. I will, and... I will zoom the region zoom as, the you as you mentioned. Okay. okay. Busher, go to view and uh, uh, make it full screen. Yeah. This down below. Yeah, full screen. Yeah. So now. Uh, so can, oh, you it, uh, uh, so can you zoom it? Can you zoom it? Oh, that is that was better. <laughs> okay. So fit to width would be okay. Fit to width would be okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, my uh, preliminary uh, analysis uh, is with respect to the uh, rainfall uh, event which rainfall occurred over the uh, Maladu region uh, during 2015. So uh, this study is uh, uh, this study is Okay, so we will continue. Okay, so we will continue. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, as, so, as you all know, the major rain fed major rain fed for the Tamil Nadu region is during the northeast season. Generally, the 48% rainfall is achieved during North March for the Tamil Nadu region. So, during the 2015 period of northeast northeast monsoon over uh, Tamil Nadu region, uh, excess of 50 58% rainfall was received. Uh, so, the, my objectives of this study, Bushair, uh, uh, scroll down. Uh, is to look into the uh, major two events which took over uh, Tamil Nadu region in 2015 of November and December and uh, uh, specific synoptic patterns associated with that. So to come out with this uh, study, I have utilized uh, two data sets. The one is with the ERA-5 data set from the Copernicus portal and another is the IMDA data set from the NCMRWF uh, data set. So I have taken these data sets and uh, compared it with the IMD graded rainfall. Uh, above uh, Bushir, can I just take it above? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, coming to the first uh, event which took place in November 2015. So, from November 2013, uh, there were a uh, trough of low over Andaman Sea which persisted and resulted into low pressure region. And this resulted into the well marked low over Tamil Nadu, resulting into uh, copious amount of extremely amount of rainfall over the Tamil Nadu districts. Approximately around 35 to 40 centimeter of rainfall was received over the coastal districts. So the panel on the left uh, indicates the uh, indicates the era five reanalysis data. This is for the 15th of November. Uh, the major spells which has occurred from 17 UTC to 24 UTC so that I have shown here. So uh, you can actually see. Uh, Bushar, can you just come down with respect to the observe? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Little bit. Just, just a little bit, little bit up. 
yeah thank you thank you yeah so uh, you can see the uh, era 5 data uh, showing uh, uh, copious rainfall over uh, southern south uh, coastal districts of tamil nadu uh, which is persisting from 17 and we can see the rainfall band which is seen in the era 5 coming from the uh, sri lankan region in, into northwest uh, northwestwards into the tamil nadu coast whereas the that band is not uh, seen in imda so when you compare it with the observational data which is shown here below uh, you can see uh, imda uh, showing rainfall only along the coastal sides whereas the inward or the interior the coastal districts of rainfall is not well captured there which is seen in the uh, era 5 data similarly the northern districts of tamil nadu where rainfall was uh, extremely heavy during those periods so that is visible in the uh, imda data sets whereas in era that is uh, missing coming to the next uh, uh, extremely heavy rainfall over uh, december to 2nd 2015 which took place uh, so again here the major synoptic conditions were the trough of flow which existed over southeast bay of bengal from 28th november and that again intensified into wml uh, so there were uh, reports of observation reporting around 40 to 50 centimeters of rainfall over chennai city and suburban regions so these plots are again showing summarize intense, please yes sir, intense rainfall spells during uh, the period in era 5 and in the so here again you can see the uh, uh, rainfall is less or you can say uh, not very well captured with respect to the uh, coastal districts whereas the era 5 has shown a over prediction or rainfall over the districts uh, so uh, sir, with respect to this uh, study uh, i have taken few more studies which i have not shown here so other uh, considering the cases with respect to some similar events of depression or another uh, extreme heavy rainfall events with uh, consignment of these studies we can kind of come to a conclusion with respect to the data sets sir. thank you thank you so uh, Busair actually uh... so shibin i have one question so uh, according yes. to you which one is the good one ara or imda uh, uh, see uh, good one in the sense again that is what i'm saying um, this is with respect to these two cases which i have taken and yeah. uh, i have even uh, seen with the upper level boticity and other wind products also uh, so my uh, consensus here is if i am able to consider similar cases maybe with that just with one or two cases maybe i won't be able to come to a conclusion maybe three or four cases which i'll be doing now i think then i can kind of conclude with your question Nabushe. okay okay, okay. Uh, Busair, you pre open your presentation there actually mr reji is there he is actually requesting again thank you Yeah. Mr. Reji, can you please continue? Uh, is it audible, sir, now? Okay, okay, madam. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. <laughs> thank you, sir. Actually, I had some issues. So okay, I had sir. to come to office right now. Please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for your support, actually. Uh, myself, Reji Maria, I would like to uh, present uh, a topic that is a marginal gradient of sea surface temperature over the Bay of Bengal and its association with the summer monsoon rainfall in the Indian subcontinent. Well, it is well known that there is a re remarkable uh, an, uh, relation between the SSD of the Indian Ocean as well as rainfall. So uh, in this paper, we are going to identify whether there is any potential uh, strength for this SSD to uh, identify the active and break period of the Indian summer monsoon over the central India. Can you move to the next slide? Okay. So in this study, we are developed we developed a new index that is Bay of Bengal Meridional SST gradient in the SST index, which is nothing but the SST different gradient between the no, equatorial Indian Ocean as well as the North Bay of Bengal. So we identified this SST and we we found there is a we could develop an index that is high gradient days and low gradient days. Well, high gradient days are those days when the standard deviation of this SST gradient is greater than one in the PSMI, like the 
uh, the newly developed index uh, at least for three consecutive days. Then it, then it is considered as high gradient days. And when the SST index is or the gradient is less than minus one standard deviation for three consecutive days with compared to PSMI, then we consider it as log gradient x so let's go and in deep into why uh, this is important because based on the uh, high gradient and low gradient days first we can uh, compared uh, the correlation, the spatial correlation between this SST a gradient that is BMSI as well as the Indian summer monsoon and we could identify here we could identify there is a high correlation between the BMSI as well as the central Indian actually all Indian monsoon, but there is a high correlation in the central Indian region, which is above 0.7 and is significant at 95 percentage. And then we are we check what is the relation between the rainfall over the central India. So we area averaged the data of the central India and found the correlation between the uh, SST index, that is BMSI, as well as the monsoon. And we could identify there is a proceeding as well as receding phase. Well, proceeding phase is identified in a uh, blue line and receding phase is identified as red line. Well, in proceeding phase, we could identify there is a correlation of 0.85 with the PSMI as well with, and ISMR. And, and there is a correlation of 0.92 for the receding phase. So these phases are like 30 day phases, 60 day phases, like proceeding phase is 60 day and receding phase is 30, uh, 60 days. So this is actually uh, similar to our BSMI uh, ISO uh, oscillation that is a 30 to 60 day oscillation which is driving the Indian summer monsoon. So based on this identification, we could uh, check the composite of monsoon uh, rainfall during the active as well as break period or uh, sorry, uh, the high gradient and low gradient period. Well, uh, uh, the uh, first plot that is uh, this uh, this one. So this is uh, showing the high gradient period, and uh, this one showing the low gradient period. And in high gradient period, you can see there is a positive rainfall anomaly uh, in the high gradient period. That is, uh, Central India is showing a positive rainfall anomaly over Central India, and Summarize, there is a negative please. rainfall anomaly. Summarize, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and in the um, uh, 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 log gradient period, there is a negative anomaly in the rainfall. So, uh, the rainfall as well as uh, the wind also show the same, the LLJ as well, everything. So, we could identify that high gradient and low gradient days are acting just like the active and break days. So, we can say with respect to SST index, we can identify active and break period. Then, this is a great potential for the uh, further analysis in the future for identifying the actual and break. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, please, you, uh, all uh, others are requested and uh, to visit that uh, main site for the detail uh, poster. So, thank you all presenter to complete uh, little bit of our is there, but uh, out of 22, actually, we had actually sir, 20 presentations, so only two uh, is not there. Otherwise, sir, it is a um, maximum presentation uh, in this session. So, uh, thank you uh, all presenter. So, to, to, today uh, in the evening, there is uh, another session. So, all are requested to uh, attend that session in time. That invited invited session will start at six o'clock. That four important talks are there, followed by that mm -hmm. validity and concluding. So that you must attend. I think okay. You this same hall will continue the hall A na, where we are attending this one. The same link will be valid. So you are requested all to join during that time. That is eighteen hours six. Uh, uh, that is twelve thirty UTC. Okay. Till that. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir.